Welcome to another episode of Two Ales and Hockey Tales with Wally. And today I'm so excited to have on a 37 year old from Brassard, Quebec, Canada. Hockey journey took him or has taken him to Canada, the USA, and France. A staple and legend of Ruin Naranda Huskies. One season scoring 90 points and 42 goals. Had a cult following with the Daytona Beach Bombers of Ohio. He was always too good for the East Coast Hockey League, where he put up 543 points in 526 games played in the regular season, folks. He's also been running amok lately with the St. George de Boos Cool FMs of the LNAH. But his number 10, we believe, is retired for the Reading Royals of the East Coast Hockey League, where he captained and led the playoffs in scoring en route to the Kelly Cup. Welcome to the shed, Yannick Tifu. <laughs> hey, buddy. Thanks for having me, man. Hey, so it's been since uh, 2000, what was it, 2007, 2006, 2007, we played together. Yeah, 2006, 2007. I haven't seen you since, eh? No, no. Wow. It's been so long. Sometimes, man, I'm like, I feel like it was yesterday playing with fucking, we'll talk about it, but Kells, Berkey, all yeah. those guys, man. Yeah, long, long, long time ago. I, it really was. And, like, uh, we almost shocked the world in the East Coast and almost won the championship. <laughs> eh? <laughs> that would have been a miracle on ice, too. <laughs> they should. They would have had to make a movie about that one, eh? <laughs> oh, that's for sure. That's for sure. With everything we went through that year and oh. all the way to the hotels, the, I, we'll talk about it later, but I don't know if you were there where you were in the A, but when we slept at the Dollar Inn, I think it was called a Dollar Inn on the way to Johnstown. Man, there was a few was things I heard about while I was up. I wasn't up for much or didn't play much while I was up, but I missed some legendary things. Um, <clears throat> okay. You know what? Let's get, you know, what? yeah. So, you know, one thing why I want to have you on, you're always a great teammate and great dude. And you're always happy to be at the rink. That's what I always like being around you. But um, you were in my career, I would say the first person to handily outscore me on my team like handily dominated me. Yeah, but well, you're up in the A, that's why. No, man, you played 65 games for Dayton. I played 57. You had 77 points and I had 44. You had thir 33 more points than me in meh, seven more games. Not, yeah. I think that year too, I was in Dayton too. I think I had, and in Phoenix too, I got traded from Phoenix. I don't even remember who I got traded for, but yeah, but you know what? It was so fun that year. We had, we had a good team to be honest. Yes. We almost shocked the world by, by well, we lost in six or five against five. Iowa, I think five, yeah. uh, which they had a great team, but you know, at the end of the day, yes, we almost shocked the world, but we had a pretty good, decent team though, to be honest, like your well, team was really, and I don't know if you remember, but down at, down in the playoff, down the stretch, we had Philip Dupuis, who played for Colorado, played for Toronto, who yeah. came down to the playoff all buses. And uh, Berkey was just, Adam Burkle was just unreal that year. And that was our unreal. goalie, folks. That guy was out of his mind. <laughs> he he was yeah. stopping everything. Um, but uh, fun fact for the pod was Philip Dupuis, when uh, Syracuse called me up late season when they're not going to make the playoffs to give me a cup of coffee and a thanks for what <laughs> nothing. <laughs> um, they called me up when they're out of the playoffs and I turned that into a recruiting trip for my Dayton bombers. And I, uh, I sweet talked dupes into coming down for the playoffs. And he said he was going to talk to his agent and he's like, I don't know if that's what's best for me. And I somehow convinced him it was good for him, but I guess we made it to the finals, but I don't know if I would have put that on my resume if I was him. <laughs> well, you know, at the end of the day today, now he's happy, you know, he played in the NHL, uh, yeah. find a way to uh, play. Colorado had some good season and then in Toronto was a little bit, a little bit harder. He didn't, uh, didn't get, didn't get some points, but yeah, I, I remember too. He called me. He's like, I think I'm coming down. We played together junior. So I was so excited. I was, you know what? I was the only French guy on that team. You're, I don't know if you remember, but I'm going to go with that story. As I like, called day, I had to tell that story, but I don't know if you remember when I got there, that was my second year pro. Right. Yeah. And I didn't like, I didn't speak one word in English. I was not that good. And, and to be honest, my first year in Rockford, um, didn't, didn't speak one word in English. I was lucky I had Chaz Johnson and Olivier Prue and Steve Peltier and a couple French guys, but in Dayton, my second year, no French guy by myself. And I remember, I don't know if you were there, but Kells, 
Paul Kelly, for, for, for the guy who doesn't know who Paul Kelly is. Uh, Kel's always in the morning when I got to the rink, I remember once a week would put words on the board and say, Tiff, try to read those words. And I couldn't read those words. And the guys were just laughing. But it was funny, though. It, it was not mean. You guys were not mean about it. And I think I bought into the game, too, of, you know what, I'm going to make the guys laugh. I'm going to have, a, like, you know, I didn't want to, like, be sour and piss about it. I, I, I play the game with you guys. And but some words were hard. It's still some word I can't even read. I'm pretty sure. But oh, uh, I, I I remember. Funny. But I like you made it fun. Like uh, when they would make the words. I remember you come in. You're always in a good mood, and your English was kind of funny at that point. But it sounds like you're doing all right. And research team was hot. Did you uh you married a girl that played some hockey? I I um uh, I married. I'm divorced from her now. Um, she played in Elmira when I when I played in Elmira in the coast. Uh, my ex-wife was playing for uh, the Elmira College hockey team. Um, she was from Perth, Ontario. Okay. Um, and a uh, family, a hockey family, three, there were three. Uh, she had two sisters. They all played in Elmira hockey. Uh, the dad was a head scout for, uh, for Hockey Canada for women, uh, like just a hockey family. So yeah. uh, she played down there for two years. And then, yeah, when I retire uh, seven years ago, um, stuff went down a yeah. little bit uh, hard you know i'm sure you've been through a lot of guys that you had on your on your podcast probably went through but when you retire from hockey it's hard to to find a way in life you know like you're like okay you gotta work you gotta do something and it was just hard like literally i was like almost a hockey bum for 10 years you know like grinding out in the coast and ea a little bit everywhere in europe and then when i got home the wife uh just didn't work out and then uh she well, went on you know own. what you're one guy that like you know, you were the only French guy in Dayton, but you loved coming to the rink every day. You loved hockey. And it was, it was infectious to everybody. Like you were our best player. Um, You loved coming to the rink. You didn't even hardly speak English, but you had a smile on your face every day. And like, man, the guy, and I was the same. I loved coming to the rink and I loved seeing the boys and having fun. And I think those are the guys that have the hardest time after, right? Cause they miss it the most. And it's not necessarily the game you miss, right? It's, it's the guys making words up and trying to get you to, to say it or whatever, right? It's the little games that you play at the rink, right? And that's the thing is I always said to, and we're probably going to come down now because we're probably going to talk about it. But um, the reason why I came back right now for a little bit, we'll talk about it, but I'm playing in the States right now, but not for the, not too long. I'm here for two weeks, but that's what I said to the, to my, uh, I have a brand new girlfriend now. It's been two years. And I said, you know, I just miss, I miss being around the boys. That's what's fun. And I'll be honest, I'm here down right now in, 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 in Watertown, New York, and I have guys on the team that are 22 years old. And I'm like, man, can you believe that when I start playing pro, you're four years old? <laughs> like, like, this is like, I'm like, what do I'm doing here, man? 37 years old. And, <sighs> but like that is just to be around the boys and, you know, you play, you play a long time, you know what it is and just be part of the group, go on the road, have some stories um some yeah. stories you can tell some story you can't tell <laughs> but just having fun having a blast enjoying man. life and yeah doing yeah. what you want to do it's your passion right i when i retired i had a very hard time and then when, like i was injured for a season watching it but then i moved back to canada don't have a job for like six months and uh started working like cash for a carpenter and like doing odd stuff and it was like it was so difficult. And then I remember like the doctor said I should never play hockey again. I could never play, never get cleared to play pro, but like, you don't have to get cleared to play senior A. So I ended up playing voluntarily just to meet people around the new area. It made around here feel like home. Cause I met guys that were like a different, like you said, 10 years younger than me. And then all of a sudden I had new friends around town and it made me feel like this was home. And that's what hockey does. And when you don't have it, when you wake up every day and you don't have that in your life, man, it's tough, right? Oh yeah, it is. It is. And I'm not, I'm lucky right now because everything with the COVID is shut down. And um, I work with a, I work in a hockey back home in Academy. So I teach hockey for the last four years. Uh, but I got lucky. My boss uh, were, were shut down for a couple of days. So I asked him, can I come down? And like I said, we'll talk about it. But I'm in the I came down to the FHL Watertown Wolf with a guy who did uh, a French guy that played with me in the Quebec League. And he said, you want to come down for four games? It's 10 days straight. 10 days. We're going to be down in New York. And you know what? I said to my wife, I need to go. I told my boss. And he's like, yeah, just go ahead, man. Have fun for 10 days. And so I said, it's just I'm here to have fun. 
Um, I'm not going to lie, though. I played two games in four days, and I feel like I'm 70 years old right now. I'm like, what? <laughs> I got two more games to play. This, I almost I almost pull a shoe. I say, you know what? I'm going to go back home. I can't do it. <laughs> but I just oh. want to stay here and have fun, though. See, for me, what I missed was going for, like, a trophy, being part of a team and going for a trophy and, like, trying to rally the troops to, like, figure out how we can get there. And um, I found how to do that was coaching my under-11s, coaching my son's team. And, like, mm-hmm. I love it because it's, like – but now they took that away from us. And it's, like, I just want to go back so then I have that, right? And it's uh, – yeah. I know why you go down there. They take it away from you, and you're sitting around going, what am I doing? Well, I can go play hockey, right? Yeah, that's it. Like we, like I can't teach hockey back home, and then the Quebec League where I play the LNAH, um, we can't play uh, um, if we don't have fan because that's the way we get paid, right? If there's fan yeah. in the stand, because get paid per game. And right now we're at zero percent. So if we can get fifty percent, at least we'll start. Uh, so hopefully by February we'll be okay. But like I said, I was home for two weeks doing nothing, and I'm like, man, I, I got to do something. I'm losing my mind here. That, so and I'm that, going yeah. out. And that's what I'm doing here. Trying to teach the kid too. Like they're young. Uh, those kids have a dream too. They want to make it to the ECHL. They're there in the F- FHL. They want to go to SP to the, to the coast. So I'm here to help them having fun with them, uh, you know, at practice, just, uh, you know, like th- those guys are probably like 37 years old and you're still laughing, come into the rink. You're the first at the rink. Like what's wrong with you? I'm like, boys enjoy when you can. Cause when you get older and, and you see it coming, Oh, yeah. uh, down the lane and you have one year left, two year left. You're going to see how you wish you went back when you're 20 and 21 and enjoy every morning at the ring. And that was when I went to Cardiff and why I had so much fun there was I knew it was nearing the end. You know, I had two little kids, obviously a year in the UK league, I'm doing the school and it's like, okay, this is coming to an end. And that's when like kind of the light bulb switches on, right? It's like, this isn't about next year's contract. It's not about how many goals or points you score. It's, it's about having fun, enjoying the game and doing everything you can to help the team win. Right. (laughs) Yeah. That's what it is. And you know, like down, down at the, towards the end of my career, my last year, when I went back to Reading, um, that's one thing too. I I I told Larry Corville, my coach, and I was like, you know what, this is, this is my last year. I want to go down and, and have one more year having fun and I said if you ever scratch me uh, the only thing I'm asking can I go behind the bench be part of the group uh, maybe help with the power play the video and everything and the first time you ever scratched me you got scratched called. yeah but it, I would I told him though I didn't want to play three and three uh, uh. I was really gassed I was like man I'm old uh, let's be honest too. I never really took care of my body. I was not the kind of guy in the summer that go back and train. That's probably why, you know, never made it maybe more game in the A. Uh, I relied on my talent a lot, like for a long, a couple of years, I'm actually 10 years of pro. And uh, I told Larry, I just want, I don't want to play. But the first time he, he scratched me, man, he felt so bad. He called me. He's like, Tiff, can you come to the rink? I was like, yeah, man, we had the rink and then showed up to the rink. He's like, I, tonight you're, you're, you're not going to play. And, and he was so nervous, so nervous. He had me for captain for three years. He's like, Larry, man, why do you look so nervous? Should, we should have a beer right now and talk about it, man. I'm not nervous. I'm happy to not play tonight. Like, it's okay. Uh, yeah. And then that year I ends up playing, I think, 40, 50 games, 60 games. I didn't play all the regular season game. Um, but you know what? Load, I enjoy Load it. management, it they call that. <laughs> load management. <Yeah. laughs> and, and you know the worst part is one game. Well, I'll tell you that story. I'll tell that story today. Do it Larry, right now. Do it right now. When it's Larry, when it happens, you got to go with it. I've, I've been – we're in Manchester. We're playing a three and three. And then Larry, before the, 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 the road trip, told me, you're not going to play the three and three. You're okay with it. I was like, yeah, I don't want to play three and three. So he's like, pick – Pick two games. So I'm like, okay, I'll play Friday and and Sunday. I don't want to play. I don't want to play Saturday. It's like, okay, so get there, play the Friday. We get to the Saturday game, morning skate. Do the morning skate. Do the bagger with Kurt McDonald after. You know, like when you don't play, you do a little bagger. Yeah, uh, I was with a, another rookie on uh, who was not playing. I don't remember who it was. So after I went back in the dressing room. Uh, get undressed, do a little workout, which I was taking care of my body. You know what? At the end, towards the end, I was a little bit taking care of my body because I wanted to show the good example to the kids and say, listen, it doesn't matter. You don't play. You got to do the right thing to come back in the lineup. So work out a little bit. And then after that, yes, it went downhill. I went back to the apartment, uh, to the hotel, 
had a little power nap, woke up. I'm like, I'm going to go grab something to eat across the rink uh, at the bar, have a bite to eat, have a beer, and showed up for the 7 o'clock game, you know? Yeah. I'd like, I'll show up at 6.30. So showed up at the bar at like 4.35, I think. So I had a beer, order a little appetizer, grab another beer. Yeah. Then I'll, I'm looking at the menu, and they have that sampler. Like it's like on a piece of wood, and you have like four or five beers that you can the try. Flights, not, they, yeah, the flights. Yeah. They give you the different kinds. Yeah. I'm like, man, I, I saw somebody walk by, a server walk by with that. I was like, wow, I want that. So order that, yep. finish it. Boom. Get another beer. So I'm probably like four or five beers deep, you know? Yep. And then I order my food, cell phone ring. Larry. Got to play. Hey, Larry. He goes, Tiff, where are you? I'm, I'm at the restaurant right now. Larry, I'll be soon at the rink. It's like, it was like six o'clock where I'm up. It was like at 6.30. <laughs> so four or five beers in an hour. It's pretty fucking damn good. Yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and, then, and then he goes, Nick Luco. Just got just roll his ankle playing two touch. You got to play. <laughs> I'm like, oh my god. So I okay, I'm coming. Ran to the ring. I ran to the ring. I was like, I'm gonna sweat out a little bit of the beer. I, I'm, I'm not drunk, but I'm like tipsy, you know, a little bit. And, tipsy. and the sweating might not even help that, right? No. So I get back to the ring. I walked in, go in the shower quickly. Warm up is like in 15 minutes. Guys are laughing, staring at me. They they know. So I look at the board, ends up not being playing to first power play and second line. Ends up having two apples in the game, but I swear to God, in the warm up, I couldn't even stand up almost. Like it was like, man, everybody's going so fast left and right on me. Like I was like, whoa, this got to slow down a little bit. Yeah. And then ends up having two apple on the power play, though. You're a pro. But You're a pro. I don't, hey, you, you got to learn how to play guilty before you play a pro, eh? Yeah. Well, I, one of my best stories, I would say, was the year we played together in Dayton. I hadn't, uh, I got called up after a road game. Um, we had played a road game on the Friday, then bus all the way to uh, Reading, I think from like Trenton or something. We had been on the road, whatever. You play Friday, bus all the way to Trenton, stay the night. And then we go to pregame skate and they're like, well, you're not playing here tonight. You're playing for Syracuse. You got to fly there now. So then I fly to Syracuse for the Saturday night game. That's that same day play. And Dayton had asked for me back Sunday afternoon. When I got called up to Syracuse, which is where my contract is, is where I want to be, or you should want to be. Yeah. Um, and and Don McAdam asks for me back for the Sunday afternoon game because he needs a player. So I finally get called up. And the East Coast says, no, we need him back. So I'm so pissed off after the Saturday game. The Syracuse boys are all going out. I'm like, this is bullshit. I'm going back to the Coast more to play an afternoon game. And all these guys are having fun. I finally got called up. So I hit the town with the boys. Um, yeah, yeah, I may or may not have peed the bed that night in the hotel with Joe Collin and this, and we they only gave us a big sized bed, so I'm pretty sure Joe Collin was in the bed with me on the other side. And sorry, buddy, if you're just I never talked to you about it. <laughs> um, but anyways, um, then I almost missed the flight back, and I had rode the mechanical bull at the bar, pulled my hamstring, and then get the flight back to Dayton. We play in the afternoon, and uh, I was second star, goal and two apples. <laughs> hey just a natural guy just hey natural. i me and you had a lot in common buddy <laughs> well you know like those are funny story at the end of the day you know i sometimes i wish i didn't do it that way but you know what it's part of it's part of my journey it's part of who i am i even though i never played in the nhl i wish i did but you know what? at the end of the day it's it, it was part of me learning myself and yeah. then today a better person because i learned from my mistake and you know what? I enjoy every moment of it, man. I played what 800 game and you know, it's, it's, it's more than some guys will ever do. You know what I mean? At the end of the day, I Dude, didn't and do you it. Were, way you, ran a, you ran a muck everywhere you went and I'm sure you had fun everywhere you went, but like sometimes, you know, having fun happens. And it's like, for me, yeah. I, I did it out of anger. I did it out of spite. And I'm like, I'm so angry. I'm going back to Dayton tomorrow. Like watch this. <laughs> <laughs> But then I still uh, played and like I did it internally. I never told anybody what I'd done and I went out and played and I maybe told a couple of the boys, but. <laughs> but hey, that's what happened is when you play guilty like that, you're always like, you know, the guys know and, and you play better because you're, they're like, man, if I, if I fucked up, guy's going to be mad at me. You got, so, you hold yourself accountable. You're a proud player. You got to play good for the yeah. boys. You're a teammate, right? No. So that's why, but like, I mean, I didn't play. I wouldn't say I would have played 800 game hangover, but like it happens probably two or three times that I was on a, on a little, you know, 
a little hangover. I would say two to three times a year, you still got to challenge yourself, still got to test yourself, still got to let yourself know you can play hungover. Yeah, you have to. You have to, folks. You got to test yourself. Builds character, especially if you do it as a full team. <clears throat> anyways, that's what brings teams together. The rarer one. But anyways, uh, that season and date and K, this is all. St- we're still into how we know each other, folks. So this could be a long one. I hope you don't have to go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you led our team in scoring by quite a bit. Ran a muck. In the playoffs, do you know who our leading scorer was? It was Paul Kelly, I think, or or uh, what was that? We called him Borat. <laughs> no, was it? What? yeah, it wasn't Borat. Kristofsky? <laughs> or so he had a lot of points though. But Did I he? think it was Paul no, Kelly. No, so it was Paul Paul, Paul Kelly. Kelly with 20, and then I had 18, and then you had 17. So Paul Kelly led our team in playoff scoring, and uh he didn't play with you, did he? He wasn't on my line. No, no, he didn't play with me. He played with Borat. He played with Borat. That's how our team, yes. we, we were deep, man. And you played with dupes in the playoffs, right? I, I had with Duke. I had Joe Cullen and Miser, who was episode 28. Fun times. Shout out to Woody's Pub, our with, first uh, sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> I think I played with uh, Ernie. Oh, Matt Hernison, right? I think and I Dukes. played with Matt Hernison, and and and, and that's Dukes a good and... team, man. When you look at our yes. lineup, and then we had Farnyuk on D. He was a good D man. Yeah, Scott Ford, Fordo, yeah. Fordo, and Labinsky. Good team. Yeah, Craig. And how do you? So I always found Derek Clancy, the coach of that team, <laughs> shaped my career. He was the one that taught me how to play defensive side first. He was annoying about it, but like I never got to like put it between my legs or do spin a Rooney's, which sucked. But like. He made, he taught me defense. He, uh, he made me a pro. I would say that year. I don't know what you thought of him as a coach. Uh, Clance, Clance, probably to be honest uh, with Larry Corville, which I got to give a lot of uh, credit to Larry because Larry believed in me and, and, you know, we won a championship together, Larry and me. So we're really, really close, but yeah. Derek Clancy, same as you, to be honest, he was just made me a, uh, became a better hockey player to be honest he was hard on me really yeah. hard uh yeah. really hard guy and 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 for the guys who doesn't know Derek Clancy is an all of famer in the coast he, he won he's a scout for Pittsburgh I think he's right now he's high up with Pittsburgh I think he's I, almost I think they got the new GM and then I, I believe they let him go when they got the new GM oh they probably did but he what he was there for the three cups so he was there uh, he was there and he was like the head scout for the whole deal right but he was so – same way, man. He learned me how to play defense. And, and that was hard for me to understand that my first rookie – my rookie year, I got 72 points. I'm yeah. like, okay, how the hell do I not get a call up in EA? My second year in Dayton got 90 points, which was 77 with, with Dayton, and I had like 13 in Phoenix. And then my second year, I'm like – I think I had like 57 points in like 30 games. I was leading the league. And didn't, didn't get a call up. And Clancy just told me, he's like, Tiff, if you ever want to go to the A, they don't need you there for points, buddy. They don't need you on top two lines. If you want to play over there, there's 400 players like you, buddy. 400 players that try to make it to the A. That's been skilled somewhere. They play minor hockey. They play junior NCA. They produce. They were top scorer of the team. You're not a draft pick. you got to learn how to play 200 feet and play smart hockey. Finish your hit. And you know what? At the end of the day, I was like, maybe he's right, you know. But when you're young, you don't believe it. Like, hey, man, you're being stubborn. You're like, buddy, I'm going to make it my way. My way is going to be the right way. And yeah. then I won't listen to Clancy. And you know what? He's part of the reason why I play 81 game in EA. Uh, Clancy was was helping me through to that to understand that I got to be a better player. And not just that, you got to be a better teammate too. Because when you go to the EA, they don't want to be – they don't want the selfish guy who – the guy who's going to complain, they need a team guy. And Clancy helped me to be that guy. Well, when you're getting called up from the coast, like you can't, you, you, you but you really are getting called up to be a fourth liner. And that was my whole thing. They signed me to the AHL deal, but they're like, well, the top two lines are the high draft picks and you're not a third, fourth liner. So see you down there. And then yeah. you were very much the same as me. And that's why I took off to Germany after that year in Dayton. Because I could see I wasn't like I, I wasn't going to be a top two line guy in the A. So I got a question for you. You went to France once. Why didn't you play more in Europe? Because I so another way we know each other, Chief, is I never probably would have even told you about this because I haven't talked to you. But the year after Dayton, I go over to Germany 
and I'm doing pretty well in Lansuk. And obviously they see where I played and that you had dominated me in scoring the year before. So the Ravensburg tower stars call me to ask me about you. Obviously I rave about you and tell them how good you are, but then you didn't go there. So I don't know if you ever talked to them, if they ever offered you, but I definitely got a call about you. No, they never called me. And, and I don't know why, to be honest. Um, I think, at one point, it got personal a little bit by, by losing in the final against Ido. And I'm like, man, I'm not leaving until I win that championship. And I don't know. I didn't want to go to Europe. I, I went one year, just to be honest. I, I was th- towards the end of my career, and I wanted to travel, you know, see different things. I was with my ex-wife. and But, you know, I was grinding up, and I thought I had a chance. And um, the year that I played in EA in Albany, and uh, I started the year with uh, Albany. I was with Florida. I got traded from uh, Dayton to Florida. I was 24. And um, they actually, Don McAdam called me and he said, you want to get traded? Uh, we're going to redo the whole thing. And, you know, we're changing everybody uh, where you want to go. And I know Florida, uh, I played in Rochester that year before. And a couple guys were there, McDonald and Taylor. And they were playing in Florida. I was like, hey, we want you over there. So, okay, so they got a trade. So I get to Florida, and then went right when I get to Florida, uh, they let's be I'll put it this way they couldn't afford the salary I was asking on a salary cap. So they find me a one way with Albany. So I ends up having a one way in the A at 24. And I'm like, okay, I know they they made me have a one way just so they can pay me, but it's not Albany who wants me. So I'm like, you know what, I'm gonna go there and prove them I can play yep. in the NBA. And uh I played like 19 games before that the year before. So I'm like, I know I can play. And they know and you. The so, coach knows you. Like the organization knows yeah. you. Yeah. Right? So I'm like, okay, I'm going down there. I'm gonna make that I'm gonna make that team. And I ends up having a great camp. I was playing with Jacob Petrozalic and uh Jerome Sanson play a little bit in the NHL and had a great camp, man. Two games. I had like two goals. They kept me, played nine games to start the season, didn't get one point. But the first nine game, I was first line, first power play. So really? no point. They send me down to the, uh, they send me down to, uh, to Florida, go down there. It would have been easy for me to be honest and go to Florida, go to the beach party and stuff. I'm like, man, I'm going down the coast, to come back to Albany. I know Florida's nice. I know, but I want to come back. So eventually I, I came back to, to, uh, to Albany and just went on a, like just produce. I finished the season with 37, 37 game. I think I had 18 points, but you got to think that, I had zero started, points in yeah. nine games. So I had like 18 points in 27 games to finish the season. And that's uh, feeling like you're pretty close. You're you're knocking on the door when you start. Yeah, so that's why I didn't go year. to Europe. That's why I was saying that. I'm like, okay, I'm that close. And then if I go back to the coast, I want to I want to win a Cali Cup. Uh, that year was was hard for me, to be honest. We had that bus accident in Albany. I was part of it uh, when the bus crashed. I got hurt. What, uh, okay, so hold on. Was it not Dayton? Was it not my former team? Not Albany? No, Dayton had won, and and I was with Albany in the A. We came back from Lowell, and the bus crashed on the side of the road um, that year. I just came back. Uh, I was playing my first six game. I had, I had six points, a point per game. And then uh, I, uh, in a practice, the coach met me, and he goes, uh, we're, we're having a practice, and he goes, hey, Tiff, I want to tell you, by the way, uh, you came back here. Um, you didn't go down to Florida and party and, and you took it seriously. And that's why you're here and you're being rewarded six games, six points, just keep going, keep working, you know? So start the practice 10 minutes and pull, stop at the net, uh, hit a crack, pull my ACL MCL. Oh, and I'm like, Oh my God. So three months, I was out for like almost three months. Okay. When I came back, they sent me to the coast. They're like, you're going to go play three games in the coast to get, you know, back in shape. It's been three months. He didn't play. So I went to, I went to uh, Florida. I went to Florida for three games, flew back. I flew back. We're playing to and Lowell at three o'clock game. I flew back in the morning at like five in the morning, got to Albany at like nine in the morning, went straight to the rink, wait for the guy. I didn't go to the apartment. We're leaving. We're about to leave for Lowell. Went to Lowell. That game I play on the fourth line, which is okay. You know, I just came Did back. That, so, yeah. Uh, I played like four or five shift. On the way back, bus crash, back again on the injury for like a month and a half. I, 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 uh, my back was, I, I, I hurt my back. So I was back again on the injury for a month and a half. 
it was a miserable season to be honest it was just how, up and how down how many guys it, got hurt on the bus every, uh, a lot got hurt to be honest some guy had a little little injury but i think we called up like 12 guys from the coast after like uh, pema sanson uh, jensen got hurt K- uh, casey board got hurt nick blanchard got hurt blanch was the worst uh, the guardwell went through his stomach when he cut the bus, he went through his stomach. Uh, anyway, yeah. so, man, that was just a hard season. And the year after, I thought, you know what? I proved myself and stuff. Didn't get an ADL, so went back to the coast. And I was like 25. And then and then every year, you're 20. getting a year older. And then, then they got new toys to play with every year. Yeah, so I'm like, okay, I'm not going to go to Europe now. Like, I'm 26. I'm going to grind it out. And then Larry got a trade for me. And then I'm like, okay, Reading, I made it home for me. I was there for three years, which is for me, it's a house. It's a second home. Yeah. Um, so I uh, just like, you know what, I'm going to finish my career here and I'll be happy about it. Well, we, uh, we went really fast through a bunch of stuff. Cause I have a lot of questions about all the places we just talked about. Okay. <laughs> I'm ready, but, um, no, seriously, I, I get it. And now I know why you didn't go to Europe as much because when you're in the AHL and if you're putting up those numbers and you're going those heaters, like, man, you're right there. And like, there were guys, I remember when we were in Dayton, we're playing the Everblades in the semifinals and they had guys on their team that we were playing against that had literally played in the NHL that season. And then you start realizing like, you're really, you're in the coast, but maybe you're not that far away. (laughs) No, no, that's that thing too. You always got to think you're not like, I mean, you're two level below. It goes quick, man. It goes quick. And you never know, like at the end of the day, ECHL, had like 700 guys that play ACHL that play in the, H- in the NHL. 700 guys, seven, probably yeah. 750. I don't know what's the number exactly, but it's around 700. Uh, it's 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 pretty good. So you always think you got a chance, you know what I mean? Like you believe and you grind it out, but yes, part, it's a the, long way, but it's not that long. The part for me though, that really turned me off was like this, like the year in Dayton, right? Like there were guys getting called up and like, I didn't understand roles. I was probably like you, right? A little naive that like, we're always the scorer, we're always the top scorer at every team we had been on. And then you get to pro and like, you're like, well, if you gave me ice time, I could still score, but like, they don't give it to you. So then you're on a third, fourth line. And like those third, fourth lines, they're role players and they play a certain way and they don't play like me and you, they skate fast. They chip it out. They chip it in. They don't have creativity. They don't make many plays, at least back then. And like, we didn't fit that role and it was hard, man. And I just, when I saw guys getting called up that I'm like, if you put me in a one-on-one game with him, <laughs> it's not even close, but oh, then they, they'd get called up and you're like, I hate this. <laughs> I'm going to Germany. But sometimes I would assume, I would assume too, you know what? One thing that sucks and I, I found it towards the end of my career. I, I, I found, I, I find it out, but I didn't know at the start of my career, I was a little bit like, you. I was like, how does this guy get called up? And I didn't get called up. But I know at the end of the day, and I know Larry was not like that. Um, he never been like that. But some coach, they hold on you. You know, team from the A call and say, I want this guy. And it's like, ah, man, I have a big weekend coming. Can you take that guy? And, and that's like, when you what? ride the mechanical bull. That's when you're like, I don't want to come back for the Sunday afternoon game. I just worked to get called up. And now you're asking for me back on a Sunday afternoon game. Leave me alone. I'm in the HL now, right? That's why some coach hold on you. You know what I mean? They, they yeah. and, and And you know what? I'll say, I'll, I got that story too. My year, I was in, the year I was in Dayton, the la, the second year after you guys left. And you're leading the league. We didn't have a good, good, good team, to be honest. We had Mathieu Baudouin, who played, uh, he played in the air a long time. He played for San, San Antonio. and But we didn't have a great team, but we were going to make the playoff. And I get called up to Albany. I go there, play five games or three games or something like that. I got two points. I think I was like at two two points in three games. Now after the weekend, they said, "Hey, we can't like we you came for the weekend. You had like your three games or five game or whatever, but we got called. We got guys coming from Carolina, but don't go too far. You're gonna go to Rochester. I think go to the hotel, grab your stuff. But I think Rochester's gonna call you, which was Randy Cunningworth and man, they had like they were dead last, but they had Clark MacArthur, Main Carey, uh, Jewel Arman, and Anthony Stewart." But sometimes last place in the AHL is the best place to go because then they're going to give guys chances that aren't the high draft picks, right? Like for me, I saw guys leave school that, you know, they're similar to me and they leave and they don't, they're playing in the coast like me, but then their AHL team sucks. So then all of a sudden they 
call guys or the NHL team sucks. So they call HL guys up. And then all of a sudden, all these guys that weren't going to get a chance, all of a sudden get a chance. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so I get down to Rochester. Finally, they pick me up. So go down to Rochester. Love my time in Rochester. To be honest, I played 15 games. I had three points, a goal to assist, but that's where I found out in the A what was going to be my role. I was a third line role guy. Loved it. I played defensively. I was like, be honest, I've never been good defensively, but I was like, you know what, taking care of my own end, didn't care about the points. I was like, man, I'm there. I finally made it. Uh, that was a year before I went to Albany. So uh, down there, nice. Randy Connie worked so nice with me, loved me. And then we're in. We're so were you uh, getting eight. power play time at all? Uh, I, I did once in a while, but not that much. Uh, they had their guy, man, Carey, Grand Granny, Clark. Uh, were you like, penalty I, killing? Not even, but yeah. I was okay, you know, but I remember the, the game that I got, like, I got two points, I got three points, I go to assist in 15 games, but the, the game that I pulled my points was when some guys were hurt and I ended up being on the first line with Grand Gany and, and Mancari, or I was playing with Clark, um, Clark MacArthur, but anyway, so playing my 15 games, win bingo, we lost 4-3 in overtime, which I was playing in overtime. I was there for the goal that they scored. You got a shift in overtime? Wow. I got a shift in overtime. That game, I had a goal in bingo. Uh, and after the game, he met me. He's like, hey, Tiff, we're going to Cleveland next week. Uh, we're leaving, I think, Wednesday. And it was like a, a Saturday. So he's like, you're going to go to Dayton. We got you a flight. You're going to go to Dayton. Pick up your, your stuff at the apartment, and we're going to sign you for the rest of the year. I'm like, wow, here's my break. I finally got it on my... That was my fourth year pro. I finally got my, uh, yeah, it was my third year pro, third yeah. year pro. I was like, and I got my break. I'm 23. Got it. So he's like, Hey, I'm asking you a question. And that's what I'm telling the story about when you say like, man, I didn't want to go back to the coast and yeah. but they need me. So Don McAdam was, we're playing Cincinnati at home the Sunday afternoon. And he's like, Don asked me if you would mind playing with them tomorrow while you're going to get your your stuff at the apartment because they're down a lot of player. And then you pick up your stuff and you'll fly on Monday and you'll meet us in Cleveland. And, you know, I'm, I love the game. Like you said earlier, I love the game. And I knew that I was not going to make the playoff with Rochester. And at the end of the year, probably they were going to send me back. And I'm like, man, I'm a teammate guy. I can't let my teammate down. Even if I'm a Rochester American now, Dayton is still... Don't tell me you got like, hurt in that game. First shift, I go coast to coast, score a goal. You know, when you come down from the eight, you go to the coast. Oh, it's way easier, right? Eh? Oh, yeah. You're, yeah. you're on the level. It's oh, just, yeah. Everything's so yeah. easy. Oh, yeah. You're, you're back feeling the, the groove. Yeah. I'm just sitting on the bench, exhausted. I flew in the morning. Like, I was, I was gassed. So, Don sent me out there, and I'm going to remember my whole life, right in front of her bench get the puck i move i see the guy coming i move my puck i get ready to hit to, to get hit and then he hit me like a little bit blindside i i fell uh face face to the board hit my hand my hand broke my wrist never that's what's hard for me is rochester i never signed the contract before i left so they never call me after they just said okay he's done for the year he, yeah so i stand I ends up being in and in, in, uh and Dayton, I didn't even make the playoff. I was out for four months. I was out. I didn't even play nothing. And then the year after, that's where I got traded. And but Rochester never called my agent in the summer. Said, "Hey, let's." But I think well, Randy Cunningham well, yeah, got well, fired. Randy Cunningham got fired. They, they changed the whole thing. And then I never got my buy. I got lucky. I got a deal with with Albany. But man, I was so mad for one game. I oh. couldn't say no. I couldn't say no. I said yeah. yes. You, you know, no, and like the thing can. is, is like you are who you are, and like the re your reasoning for playing that game, like it's one game, right? How what are the chances that happens? And like you were a great teammate, and that's why you want to play that game. And I would get it because, like, if you're gonna end up in Dayton for the playoffs, you're gonna want to be part of that team, right? Because yeah. when I got called up to Syracuse, I felt like I was part of Dayton. I didn't feel like I was part of Syracuse. I'd go up there. And I didn't feel like part of the team, but I'd come down with you guys. It was, I was part of that team. Right. Oh, that's why. So I was like, I, there's no way I can say no, but you know what? It's part, it's, it's part of life. You know, I was, I was mad, but I was like, man, I'm 23. I'm going to get a chance. But at that time I'm thinking about, wow, I just, I got a hurt making 400 bucks a week. Now I could have get hurt in the A, make more money. <laughs> yeah. For the rest of the year. <laughs> that's yeah. What, 
that's that sucks now i'm stuck with my 400 and maiden now i'm stuck here for the year man oh <laughs> uh, you were way too good for the coast too when you're in dayton oh man it was wild watching you um okay we got to get into this because we haven't done my normal routine, but we're going to start now. We're going to get on the rails here real quick. We'll go a little quicker because we've been chatting, but growing up in Broussard, is that where you grew up? Yeah, grew up in Broussard. How did you get into hockey? Is that that's what everybody does in Canada or what? <clears throat> yeah, my, my, dad, my dad played hockey growing up, uh, you know, like, so it's an easy thing. You're from Quebec. Uh, I, you know, in the winter, you play hockey. In the summer, you play, you play different sports. I played soccer, but... I always been a hockey guy. Uh, I think I was like two months and my, I have a picture at home with my dad and I have a hockey stick in my hand. Um, you would, you wouldn't be surprised. I had a Montreal Canadian stick in my hand. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah. So just starting to play hockey when I was uh, three fell on the ice uh, and then hurt myself. And I said to my dad, I never want to play hockey again. I don't want to put skates. I was so scared. Three years old fell on the ice and finally, Sorry, when I got seven years old, started playing, you know, in my in my town, and and that's where it went from there. Um, so Broussard, Quebec, is that a big town? I don't know it. Uh, it's on it's it's on the south shore of Montreal. It's 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 a decent town. It's pretty big. Now we got bigger. Uh, we built. It's called the Ten Thirty. There's restaurant, and then that's where the Montreal Canadian have their facility practice rink which is huge a lot of houses so it got bigger and bigger and bigger but it's like 10 minutes from downtown montreal 10 15 minutes okay from montreal. so that's right you're in the city then you're a city boy then <laughs> so then um how does it go then were you what is college charles lemois yeah that's mid, yeah that's midget triple a so that's like five minutes from the house that's i thought I college it was going to be like a prep school I, it, it's a little bit different than you guys, but yeah, it, it is, it's like a prep school, but it's a little, you're 15 or you're 15, 16 years old and you go to school there and then you play hockey. But like I said, it was five minutes from my house. Okay. So you're living at home. Yeah. I was living at home. I didn't have a billet. So then you get drafted to ruin Naranda Huskies and that's not at home then. That's not at home. That's like, it's close to Sudbury, right? I remember when I played Naranda, Naranda, we used really? to play exhibit game against uh, Sudbury which is probably three or four hours, but it's like seven and a half from home. So, so leaving it's at, way up leaving, there. Oh yeah. 16 years old, man. Leaving home like that back in the day with my girlfriend. I'm not going to lie. I don't care. You know, you guys can laugh, but I was crying. I almost said I'm going back home. I was crying, man. 16 Cause years you were old, leaving, leaving your girlfriend. girlfriend. No, my, 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 I mean, I went to school with her, so she stayed there, but like, you know, you're 16 years old and you think she's the one for the life oh, and you yeah. got to have kids and stuff. <laughs> and, you know, first time ever you're leaving home. I'm like, man, I don't want to leave. I want to be like in my stuff, play home. And, and you know, all like, your friends but, you grew up with it. It is quite the decision for young yeah. hockey players when to leave home. I, I didn't have to do it as early because I went NCAA, but I still was leaving. I think I was 17. What were you, 15? I was 16. 16. Yeah, I was almost 18. So, yeah, no, it's... uh. It's very interesting I, how actually, no, I was almost 19. That's what it was. I, yeah. It's totally different. I, I went through high school at home. Right. And it's like, yeah. it was comfortable where you guys like major junior, they go, they leave young. Oh, I, imagine a kid who's 16 who doesn't speak a word in English and go to Halifax or PEI and he's from Montreal. This is, at least I got lucky. I Isn't that in- a strange league? How it's like the mixed languages where there's the French cities, then there's the English guys and then there's English cities and, it is. And to be honest, my first couple of years in Ren Aranda, my first two years, we didn't have that much like, you know, maritime kids and stuff. It was, you know, it was so deep in Quebec City. So the French story was it was it was French, French, French. Deeper you get in Quebec, the French is, is a little bit, you know, deeper a little bit. It's hard to it's hard to explain. But it's like I, I keep saying like people like, you know, in Texas, the way they speak English compared to somebody who's from New York or somebody's from Boston, you know, there's different length. Like oh, English. there's lots. When you listen to my podcast, there's a lots of ways to speak English. <laughs> so, so you see, so that's why, like, we didn't have that much. And then when we got uh, the coach, and uh, now he coached for uh, for Phoenix, Andre Turing, you coach Phoenix, he got there, he started drafting a lot of maritime kids. And it was a language barrier, though, because Andre didn't speak English neither. So the assistant coach had to do the, the, the meeting, the pregame meeting was in French with Andre and then the assistant coach would do it in English. And then we had those maritime guys. So it was kind of complicated a little bit. We had both in the dressing room, but my first two years was all French, no English guy. 
Right. Um, and speaking of a guy that played for the Quebec Nordiques and the Toronto Maple Leafs, I got to bring this up before I forget. As I got a signed Matt Sundin jersey from the Leafs behind me, and I'm raising money for sick kids in Toronto, um, and I'm raffling it off on my website, www.aleshockeytales.com, and the raffle is going until I think mid-February. So buy your tickets, and whoever wins it will get this signed Sundin jersey who also played for the Nordiques, which I like them way more than the Canadians. I don't know why I just did as a kid. <laughs> um, but anyways, maybe it was Joe Sackick or Matt's. I don't know what it was, but okay. I had a couple things come up in my brain that we got to talk about while we were talking about Ruin Naranda. Actually, it's a story you told me when we played in Dayton. For some reason, when you were coming on, this clicked in my brain. You told me a story of playing junior against Crosby and you waited outside the locker room for like an hour or something to get a signed stick, right? Yeah, I, I, you know, uh, I was nineteen twenty. My uh, my uh, my nineteen year old and my overage year juniors was and six. that's that and that's what I mean is like you were scoring forty two goals and getting ninety points, and you're waiting outside the room to talk to a sixteen year old. Well, I, at that time he was seventeen. He was it's it was his last year, and I'm like, man, I may never make it to the NHL. I got the chance to play probably. A, like I knew already the guy was going to be the next big thing. And I'm like, man, and, and Sid, to be honest, was such a, such a great guy. Every city that he goes, he would be outside of the dressing room after and wait in line to get everybody to sign while his team was sitting on the bus. He would wait an hour and he would do every single guy. And then even if there was like a hundred left and he's like, I, somebody was like, Hey, we got to go in. He's like, no, I got to finish everybody. That's probably and, changed now. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, probably. <laughs> and then I just, I was like, man, I got to wait in line, man. And then I made it all the way to the front and he looked at me. He's like, what are you doing, man? I was like, well, I, I may get never the chance to play against you again. Would you mind having me a stick autograph or something? And yeah. Like, so yeah, you still I'll, got it. Yeah. I still got it. He was, he was nice enough to do it. And you know, that's the funny story is I got to it for, with Sid is actually his first pro, first junior game was in Randaranda. And Renaranda, like I said, it's way north of Quebec, and nobody comes to Renaranda. To be honest, like TSN, RDS, they don't come to fucking Renaranda, man. It's so no. deep, you know? Yeah. And uh, first game, I, I swear to God, I think we had the New York Post, the Australian Post, <laughs> man. We had everybody, everybody. <laughs> Morning skate, I thought there was like 200 uh, news, news reporter in the building, so... We ended up playing the game, and I remember I was playing with Dupes, Philip Dupuis. Dupes was there, and and um, he goes, uh, first game, we're up 3-1 with seven minutes left, and Sid's got no points. And um, I go to Dupes. I remember I said, ah, he's good, but, like, 16-year-old in the queue, like, I don't think he's going to be, like, you know, the next big thing. I remember Pierre-Marc Bouchard, who played for the Minnesota Wilds. I remember that name, yeah. He played at 16 in, in the queue. He, he did 96 points, you know? I'm like, okay, man, Pierre Marc was sick, you know? And ends up ends up losing the game 4-3, seven minutes left. Seven minutes left, we ends up losing the game 4-3 and sit at three goals, and uh, history was made. And the next day in Val d'Or, I uh, got six points. So he had nine <laughs> points. He ends up finishing the season with 135, and the year after, 167. <laughs> and uh, But I have an article... At home, the second story with Sid is uh, my overage year, uh, the year that Crosby won, uh, and they went to the Memcott, lost to London, to Corey Perry and all those guys, 16 that year. Um, Sid won game in uh, in um, in Rimouski. We ends up beating them 5-4 in overtime. And then the newspaper back home, the Montreal newspaper, which I still have it at home, was uh, Sidney Crosby 2, Yannick Tifu 5. I ends up with a goal for assists in the game. And uh, we won 5-4 in overtime. And believe it or not, the three-star of the game was Pouliot, Roussin, and Crosby from the other team. We didn't even get a – Crosby had a goal and assist. He had first star. Sid and Ramuski was just – like, Sid was Sid. Like, he would get first star every game, even if he didn't do a point. But this, I, I don't think I got you, the this, article at that, home. And this was – you were playing for Ramuski? No, I was playing for Renaranda. He was playing for Rimouski. Oh, okay. So this, I got you. And you got five points that night? Yeah. And then the newspaper article was uh, like Yannick Tifu five, Sidney Crosby two. 
That's a I'm good like, wow, article. That That's finally cool. Beat, I beat Crosby one time in my life. Yeah, you at did. At least one time. <laughs> I love it. I yeah, I keep that shit too. <laughs> That's cool. Um, okay. Um, I don't know why that came up. I the other story that came up because I've told my son about it, and he just randomly brought up this story tonight, and I was like, you know what? A guy that's coming to the shed tonight was on that team. Do you remember in practice, we one of our goalies was called up to the AHL, so we were down a goalie. And that guy that was a local in Dayton came out to practice, and his one testicle was hanging low under his jock, and he <laughs> took a slap shot in the net. Do you remember that? Yes, I remember that. Poor guy, man. I felt oh, bad. Oh, God. <laughs> I remember talking to him outside the rink before we got on the bus to leave or whatever. And he like lived there and like, he was like our age and his nut was the size of like a grapefruit. <laughs> I know. I remember. I remember that poor. I, I felt bad that day for the kid, poor kid. He didn't oh. sign up for that. That's for sure. Well, no. And it's like, you that. didn't sign up for that broken wrist. And that guy just came in to help us out and beat. So we'd have a goalie in practice. And then all of a sudden you shatter your testicle. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, sorry, buddy. That sucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ah, uh, a couple other stories we got to bring up though. Cause I think we're just getting random here. Okay. Um, do you remember the rookie party that year? Cause I'm pretty sure it was hosted at your apartment. Man, I don't remember. What did we do? We dressed up as girls. Yeah, I think so, man. It's been so long. Did I? I, was... I had to dress up as a girl. I know that. And it was, at, I thought it was at you and Kels's house. Probably it was, yeah, for sure. Kells was probably somewhere part of that thing. And but... you want to tell any Paul Kelly story since he was your roommate in Dayton while we're on the topic? Kells, Kells. Okay, Kels. hold on. We're going to, we'll keep this a little shorter, folks. We've been talking a while. Okay. So basically, he runs a muck and ruin Naranda and scores 42 goals one year. And for some reason, isn't getting a lot of looks, but ends up in the U Haul and pro. So that was your pro options, the U Haul. Yeah, my agent, I guess my agent said, I, w- I didn't want to go. I wanted to go to the coast. And my agent said, like, I know you got to go there. And I won't go through the details, but I found out that, you know, the coach was Steve Martinson. And then my agent was working with that guy for a long time. So I think he had the deal every time he sent him a player, you know, he would get money. A little so, kickback. Oh, yeah. They, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And oh, then yeah. I found out when I got there, there was like, a, we were seven French guy, and all those seven French guys were all, with him the same agent we all had the same agent i was like okay so i ended up being there but that was that was something different to be honest uhl for guys who doesn't know what uhl is was a little bit like the central to, towards the end an older league like i remember playing with billy tibbets uh and uh bruce watson uh to, all guys were like 30 32 33 and to be honest we're only three 20 year old on the team which we were playing on the same line was Chaz Johnson, Robin Big Snake, and me. Three twenty year old Robin Big Snake. What a kid! Oh man, this kid was unreal. Funny yeah. guy, funny guy. <laughs> Tough as nail. He could fight Chaz too, but uh, yeah, ends up being there. But I, that was not my first pick, to be honest. No, I don't think it would be. But like, it's weird to me. I have always found it interesting when, like, I was always looking at stats or whatever, and like. And then I play with a guy like you and I'm like, why is this guy in Dayton? And like, then you see, you scored 42 goals in a major junior. And you're like, so why is he in Dayton? And like, sometimes it just doesn't make sense. But anyways, so then you're in Rockford in the U-Haul and then you get 72 points in 79 games. And like, for me, I thought jumping into pro was a very big adjustment from college. And I think junior would be even a bigger adjustment than NCAA. It, it was hard to, and like I said, it was old, an older league, but I got lucky to play, like, I don't know, I, I felt home playing with th- two 20 years old. I felt like, I don't know why, like, like I didn't play with, you know, you play with a 30-year-old, you're nervous, you feel like you give him, you have to give him the puck. Oh, so, yeah, like, yeah, especially as a young buck, I totally know what you mean, yep. So you don't play your game, but, like, you know what, all the game I played with the two 20-year-old, Chaz and, 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 and Robin, and, you know, it just clicked, you know, like, if you look at their stats, I think Robin had like 20 goals, 45 points. Chaz had like 50 points. They both had 500 PIMS. Uh, man, it's just everything seemed so easy. I could play my game, and we we connected well. Chaz was 
was a goal scorer who can play the physical game. Big Snake was a goal scorer who can play the physical game. So I was the passer on the line and it just, it, it helped me to go through because like I said, if you play with a 30, 31 years old and you're 20, you get nervous. You get nervous. You just want to move the puck and then you don't play your game at all. I, that's what happened to me when I got there out of college and I went to the AHL, man, I was so nervous and like guys like were older than me and way bigger than me. And like, when I got the puck, I felt like I needed to give them, give it to them. Cause like that, some of them really weren't that even very nice, <laughs> you know? No. Like, and they were uh, like, give me the puck. Like I was open, give me the puck. And I'm like, I'm sorry. Like if I saw you open, I would have passed it to you. Like, I'm, yeah. I'm not, not passing it to you. Like, I don't know what you're, you know, but yeah, I found the AHL very strange that way, but okay. So after that year, you get a great deal. You're like, okay, I did get in the U-Haul. I'm going somewhere nice. I'm going to Phoenix, Arizona, beautiful Phoenix. Right. And you started out well there. You got, you got a point a game for, you know, that, Hey, to be honest, still as, as, at this day today, I still don't get the trade. I don't I, get I, I, on, I, I, on Dayton side. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry for uh dad bomb. Like I, I, I'm sorry. I, you know what? Like I don't get the trade either because you're younger. You got to point a game. And uh, he was kind of on his way down and pro. And like, he, he was like an angry vet, man. The when before you got traded to us, we played in Cincinnati and he took a like a bad penalty. He literally full baseball swung, hit a guy in the ankle, got like a big penalty. And then when he came to the bench, Don McAdam tried to like give him shit. And it literally almost turned into like a, a fight on the bench between the two of them. And uh, then he got traded and they got you out of the deal. <laughs> Man, I, and, and the worst part is the GM was Claude Lemieux. Who, who Claude Lemieux played in the NHL, you know. Uh, played he was your years. GM? He was the GM of the team. Like, he was not really there all the time, but he was kind of the, the GM. Which He would want guy. Dan Bond's the type of player maybe he would want because he, like, he was a guy that would fight scrap or whatever. But when he was in Dayton, he was like, I'm not doing this here. Like, this is a joke. And, they, you, know, you know, the way we were treated, and, he just wouldn't do it. And then the coach was a French guy. It was Ron Fillion. He was a French guy too. He's the one who called me in the summer. And then we're on the way to, 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 to Utah, get on the bus. I'm, we're ready to play card. We're on the bus. And, and, and you know, the worst part is it's still today, to be honest, I don't hold a grudge against a lot of people, but you wanted to trade me. I'm fine with it. Okay. I, I'm okay with it. It doesn't matter. Like I said, they were two French guy. I, I'm okay. You know, business is business. Uh, they, they wanted more toughness. I'm fine with that. But we're on the bus. We're ready to leave. And and Brad Church, who was the assistant coach, he, he got on the bus and he go, Tiff, I need to talk to you. So I get outside of the bus and I pass Ron Fillion, which he's sitting on the bench. He's the head coach. I walked outside. I saw my bag and my stick. And Church, he goes, sorry, Tiff, we needed more grip. So we trade you to Dayton. Uh, you're going to fly you're going to fly uh, tomorrow morning. I'm really sorry. Good. Best of luck, man. I, I hold a grudge against Ron Fillion because you're the head coach, man. Be a man. No. Just come to me and tell me. You want to trade me? I'm fine with it. But why do you send your assistant coach to talk to me? Right. And then, like I, I and almost, you know what? You guys don't know that story, but I almost didn't go to Dayton that year because I called back Steve Martinson, which was my coach in Rockford. And I had him for four years in the ECHL. And I said, I'm not going to Dayton. Like, I want to get back to the UHL. Like, for me, it was just Come like, okay, you, you know, know what first time getting. ever being trade. First time being trade. I don't know how it works. I got nervous. I'm like, I got to go back to what I know is Rockford. And then he said, Tiff, it's impossible. I was like, why? He's like, you're going to have to go through waivers, which you mean every single team I'll have to pass on you. And then you can come. And he's like, I doubt somebody's going to pass on, on you. Like, I doubt that all the team in the ECHL is going to pass. Somebody's going to pick you up. And to be honest, I went backward a little bit. And then when I got their best decision ever, and I said something, I, Reading for me was home. But if Dayton never folded in the ECHL, Dayton would have been my home. Because I loved it. I, I I loved the city. I loved the group of guys. We were there. I had a blast. And we lost in the final. I had a blast. But I didn't go there 
forward. I went backward for like maybe a week. And then after that, you know. Oh, yeah. Like, I, and like, I, 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 the thing you said about the coach, though, is like, I'm a head coach, right? And like, w- with the under 11 team, it's not the same. But like, if I got to talk to a parent or I got to talk to someone, like, that's the head coach's job. Like, don't ask someone else to do your job. Like, that's, that is why you're the head coach is because yeah. you, you got to do those things. And when it's time to have the conversations, it's time to have the conversations and you do it with respect and you look a guy in the eye and you, you say what happened and you say why, or you discuss it, but like, don't be a little bitch and say nothing. I don't know you buddy, but it doesn't sound like you're that good of a dude in my eyes. <laughs> oh, I didn't. I, to be honest, I, I saw the grudge against him to be honest about that part. But I, I, I would guess, too. At the end of the day, I got happy, like, you know, yes, Rockford that year won the cup. Um, we lost in the final, but you know what? I had a hell of a ride, and I had fun. I had fun. Like I said, my first <laughs> – you talked about Kells, but the first so time – So now we're there. We're in, we're in Dayton now, okay? We got traded from Phoenix. We're in Dayton now. So you move – so here's the next messed up story is like, yeah, with Miser on, he kind of mentioned it a little bit, which – that was a long time ago in the episodes. I haven't had many bombers on other than fresh fresh came on too. Yeah. Um, but <clears throat> where was I going with that? Was, uh, the guy that, that I guess the apartment you moved into had like some history that season, right? <laughs> yeah. The, 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 <laughs> the Dan nap story, the Dan nap story. Yeah. Uh, so I I'm- we're playing for date and I get called up to Syracuse and the boys are like, all of a sudden my phone starts blowing up, which like, I, it was like one of those old phones. It wasn't like they are now. And it's all the boys. Like, have you heard what's happened and wild stuff in Dayton, Ohio? Yeah. That, I was not there, but I got there. I took his apartment, but he, um, yeah. Yeah. never a fun story to be honest. Uh, no, so basically folks, it, it is what it is. I don't think we really need to talk about it, but basically he was doing some very inappropriate things online and, um, got caught and, um, don't yeah, that that's all we got to say, but yeah. you know, then he gets booted I, off the team and he's done, which no, obviously like that's the f- most absurd thing I've ever been a part of on a hockey team, but I wasn't there for it, which made it easier for me to pretend like it never happened yeah um, for me it was the thing but i got the chance to live with the legend paul kelly the uh, legend so like, paul kelly right a <laughs> good legend man yeah you remember he always every time he goes hey just doing work son doing work son <laughs> he would drink he would kill a 30 pack and just say doing work son <laughs> man i walked into that apartment and i Did don't it, know if you remember I the saw beer the picture, wall but we had 696 beer on the wall man it was a beer wall and it keeps falling down and then and he said he was gonna fill the whole wall right he was gonna fill the entire wall with beer cans yeah and Kels, what a like he keeps saying doing work son and i remember one practice and man it was saint patty it was saint patty and 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 he asked the coach can we practice early because the bar which was out of gilas you remember it was Bar Louie and Adam yeah, Gillis. Yeah. And, and he asked to have the practice early because Bar opened at like 9 a.m. on St. Patty. Or it was Cinco de Mayo or St. Patty. I don't <laughs> and he remember. said we got to practice early so we could start drinking earlier. Drinking. <laughs> so I remember I went to the bar. I went to, we went practice at like 7 in the morning, done at 8.30. So uh, Labby, Lebensky, uh, I think Miser was there, um, Kells. There was a couple guys. Fordo was there. And then we ended up going to the bar and then just start drinking and drinking and drinking. And around like one or two, I got tired. And then Lubinsky, who had a wife, he just left. And then Fordo went back. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to go back, you know, like home. I'm going to go rest and then come back later, you know. Mm-hmm. And I go to bed. I, I woke up at five, went back to the bar. Kel still there. Sitting at the bar, just doing work, son. And then, <laughs> and then I don't even know how he's doing it, man. And then he ends up like I ends up going back at like one, and I got a phone call like from from the place and say, "Can you come get Kel? He was still there at three in the morning. Just did a twenty four hour shift. Doing almost. work, son. <laughs> doing work. But the guy, I'll give him one thing, Kel. He drink. 
he, he had a he had a blast but every time he showed up to practice was always the first one was on the bike running the bike in the morning to sweat it up he, he was being he was being like you know he did his stuff outside there the, the, the rank he, but he was being a pro he never missed a practice or not nobody on practice. our team worried about whether or not he was showing up to play at night right no. that yeah I that, know that, was- everybody knew he was going to be there to play and like he was a gamer like there are gamers in the world and like, look at him. He's our top scorer in the playoffs when we almost win the championship and the coach. And he had 50 points in the season. He had 50 points during the season. And he played, he played third line and like no power. Yes. Play. He was yeah. PK guy and didn't have power play, but yeah. Legend Kels, man. I had some story with Kels. Love the guy. <sighs> um, took me under his wing, you know, like it's weird for a, a Boston kid who's got a deep accent with a French guy who can't even barely say two <laughs> words. I couldn't even order a Sprite at the you, restaurant. You guys were and, quite the pair rolled around Dayton, Ohio. That t- <laughs> but Kels, Kels was, Kels was so nice with me, to be honest. Like I said, he took care of me because it would have been easy for him to, you know, don't talk to me and stuff, but he took me under his wing. He never let me down. Um, he knew it was hard for me, a French guy coming down. I was nervous, but he took care of me day one that I showed up. But, you know, sometimes we, we, maybe we drink too much together, but we had a blast together. We had so much fun. Well, I, yeah. And like you guys had your area of Dayton where you guys had your apartments, which was half the team. And then the other half, the team was on the other side of Dayton, which was where I was with Miser and Frisch and yeah. Corey LeClaire and Farnick. But like, it is a blast. And the only thing I got to say about Paul Kelly is, Great, great player. Um, great at playing after doing work, son. However, smelliest farts I've ever played with. Oh, uh, smelliest person I've ever played with. Oh man, he was this, and, and he was so funny. He would. I don't. Know, I don't know if you ever came to the apartment, but this guy would sit with a thirty pack and just fucking the couch. I wouldn't even touch the couch because I think <laughs> the smell was in print in the couch. And he would play baseball, baseball on his PlayStation or whatever it was back in the day, 10 years ago or 15 years ago. But he was playing play all day. And he was like, I was like, hey, I'm going to go to the mall or something. And you come in. He's like, no, I'm doing work, son. And <laughs> he he just crush a 30 stuff. pack and play video games. And uh, <laughs> no, we're talking, this is what, like 16 years ago now, I think. Yeah, if literally. My math is right. <laughs> so, no, Man. I, 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 <laughs> yeah. It was a trip though when I went over there and saw the beer wall and uh, you know, <laughs> but like I every- never made another one in my career to be honest. I I mean I had a wife after. I don't think my wife would love to see a beer wall <laughs> in the apartment. I don't think it's part of the decoration in the house. <laughs> no, no, definitely, yeah. Um, <laughs> I, oh, he was uh, a beauty though, beauty. Yeah, I should was- I should get him on, hey. Eh? Are you ready? Right. He's got some story. Oh man, so then. Uh, Here's a random question that one of the pod's favorite places is you played for the Florida Everblades. Have you ever been to the Lonnie Kai? No. It's the hotel on Fort Myers Beach. Really? No, I never been. Sorry for burping the mic, folks. Oh, that's because you told me you were a pro when you went down there and you were going back up to the A. Yeah. Oh, that's it. That's tough to hear. Okay. Fair enough. You probably haven't been to Legs and Eggs then, too. That's the strippers in the morning around there, but no. Okay. Maybe I've been. I don't know if I've been. I've been to a stripper in Florida. I don't remember the name of it. But you know what? We might have gone with Dayton when we were in the semifinals. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> uh, maybe. We don't know. Okay. Um. So then in Dayton, I don't know if you got anything else, but the only thing I couldn't believe is like you had been in Phoenix. I hadn't. I had been at Western Michigan, Syracuse, and then Dayton, Ohio. And I didn't realize how people could live in the East coast. When we went to Florida to play them in the semifinals and we saw how they lived and we saw like their apartments and everything. And I was like, wow. And the beaches. And you're like, people live like this in the East coast and we're in Dayton, Ohio. And you're saying Dayton would have been your home. You liked it. You know what? I don't know. I got, I, you know, I, I, it was my first real first year pro for me. My 20 year old, I was not like, you know, like I said, the guys were 30 they were older, you know, I was not really part of like, not the group, but like, you're younger, you see, like we yeah, were like oh, yeah. three old on the team. So, um, but like going to Dayton was really my first experience. And I don't know, I, I just got, I love the place. The we were a team was, though, weren't we? We were a team. That was yeah, a team. 
we were always together. We, we, we live in the apartment right behind where the complex with Bar Louie and stuff were. We were together a lot as a team. We went out together. I don't know if you remember the bar, the Sage or something that, um, was it the Sage or I don't know what's the name, but it was uh, right next to the stripper. And then you can text and your text would appear on the TV on top. I don't know if you're, you know, I, <laughs> I don't, don't know if you remember I, that I, bar, no. No, I don't know. But anyway, we're always together. And I don't know, like, you know, when you win championship, you, you make a long run. That's where you build the team and you build, you know, friendship and stuff. And I don't know, like Adam Burko playing the NHL, but never looked at us like we're, like I, I can say, we were like piece of shit. Berkey no, always it, us so nice. Um, and I don't know. I loved it. The city was fun too. We had a blast. I, I didn't mind it. I agree, man. We did have a blast. Like it was, it was a really good group of guys. And, uh, when you look at the team, like you're right, like Berkey was an incredible goalie and he was having an incredible year, but like when, when you're in the East coast, everybody's in the East coast, right? So you don't need to treat anybody differently. And he was just a great dude. He should come on the pod too. Jeez. There's yeah. a lot of ideas. My goodness. <laughs> okay. So after the, you get traded out of Dayton to Florida. So that's almost like the opposite of getting traded from Phoenix to Dayton. So now you're happy again. You're going to where you want. <laughs> yeah. I, I was actually, I only played 24 games, but I was happy there. Um, and then playing in Albany for me too, was two hours and a half from home. So I was happy too, but like, you know what, if I'm not two hours and a half from home, I'll be down in Florida on the beach. So I was yeah. kind of happy to go down there. We had a sick team that year. We lost uh, in the first round, uh, second round, sorry. But, man, we lost nine games that year. We had a hell of a hockey team. and But I don't know why we choked that, to be honest. Um, but it was fun. Florida was fun. But I realized, and you play, you play the game too, is I realized playing north, like Florida, the, the nice place, that's not where you get your called up. Because let's be honest, and you know how it works. Like, you play in Elmira, you're playing Redding, you play in Dayton, you're, you have 15 teams at, like, two-hour range of you. So when they need a call up, they don't call up a guy from Colorado or a guy from Victoria or a guy from Alaska. They usually call a guy that's in the north. So, yes, the city are maybe less fun, but if, if you want to play hockey and yeah. your goal is to go to the A, those are the places you got to play, right? You got to play. I know Trenton. Like some guys, I never played, but Trenton didn't have a good crowd. Maybe the city was not nice, but guys get called up from Trenton because they're an hour from, from places. And if, you, if that's what you're doing, you got to put yourself in the right position yeah. to succeed. But the other thing was, is there was the East Coast AHL deals, right? Which always confused me because like if you're in the East, you, if you're signing an AHL East Coast deal, you're basically saying I'm going to be in the coast. And then you only get yeah. called up to one team. It's like, why not just sign the East Coast deal? And then you can get called up by anybody. But I guess... I don't know. It's all weird. I, right? I never understand it. I tell the young kids today when, when back home in the summer in Quebec and I heard kids are 2021. 20, they're all excited. I just signed a two way in the, in the coast. And yeah, it's like, why you do that, buddy? Yeah. You stuck yourself to one team now. Like what happened if you're in the coast and in 10 games, you got 21 points. Like but you you're did every year. <laughs> you're, <laughs> you're, you're under contract with bingo and bingo doesn't need you. Then you're still but, there. But, but yeah. But Syracuse would have like 10 guys hurt, but they can't call you up. Yeah. So it's like, I don't get when kids sign a two-way deal. I don't think they well, should. That, they should. And that's after my year with Dayton Syracuse. That's what I got offered was a Dayton Syracuse two-way. And I was like, so I'm going backwards. And I'm like, I, I, I'm not doing that. <laughs> no, it's not worth I, it. I don't like going backwards. I like moving forwards. Um, yeah. Okay. So then after that, you're that's the Albany where you play 37 AHL games. You're doing well with Florida. So that's a fun year. I got a random question. Were you all one year contracts in your career? Uh, I got, yeah, I always, I always got one year contract. Never got more than one year contract. Me too. I did the same thing and we played this. I went till 2015, 16. That's when you stopped too. eh? Yeah. And then I, I'll be honest. Good thing. I never signed more than, than one year. Cause keep, keep I know you hungry, myself. right? Yeah, me yeah, too. I know myself. If yeah. you give me too much, I'll get, I'll get, I can get, I can get sloppy. I can get sloppy and just sit on it. I know myself, man. I got sloppy on one year deals. <laughs> hey, hey, when I asked my wife 80 bucks to go to the bar, she give me 50. Cause she knows if she give 80, it it's won't gone. be good. <laughs> I 
get sloppy pretty easy. So oh, one year deal gosh. was enough for me. <laughs> and people wonder why we had fun with the Dayton Bombers, the bunch of dandies we had on that team. My gosh, was it fun when we all got together? Yeah. <laughs> you get you and Kels, and then you got me and Miser. It's like a comedy show with everybody around. And then you got Corey oh. LeClaire and oh, all of them. Lane Manson, yep. all the boys. Manson, yeah. That yeah, guy was a like, monster. He was in Goon 2, eh? That's what I was going to say. That it was him, eh? In Goon oh, 2. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He was yeah. the bad and the guy. the big Russian kid or whatever he was. I don't know what it yeah, was. Yeah, I think he was Russian. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I saw that the other I saw that last year when I watched the moon. I was like, man, this is Lane Manson. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, it definitely man. was. <laughs> yeah. Good had, guy, too. Good yeah. guy. Oh, okay. <laughs> Fun year. Um, okay. So we went through a lot of the other stuff other than. After uh, the Albany, Florida, you started with the Victoria Salmon Kings for six games, right? Yeah. Who's that? What, six games, zero points. Who's the coach? Uh, Morrison, I think, was the coach. And I asked for a trade. That year was not a good year for me. And and uh, <laughs> I, I got there a month before. And Victoria, for people who don't know Victoria, BC, which on the island of Vancouver, it's like a it's like a mini Montreal. It's just Monday to Sunday. There's bar open. It's fun, man. It's a sick city. And so I ends up going there a month before the camp to get ready, which was not a good idea for a straight month just partying. I was out. Hey, what? I'll tell a story. You know what? You went to Victoria a month before at East Coast contract. Yes, man. I was just like. <laughs> And I'll say the story because at that time I was not with my girlfriend. So we ends up going to the bar and, and I started getting friends with a girl over there. And then, you know, like we, we used to go out a couple of times in town. And one time we come back, we come back from the bar. And then in Victoria, I was staying downtown. And they have those guys that are on the bike. They're running the bike and they have that little. Uh, a full little, bar. It's a bar. Uh, no, no, but it's like you're sitting on a chair, two chairs, and then the guy's, it's like a taxi, but it's like nice. He gives you a blanket. And yeah, you see yeah. that in like some places with a horse. And yeah. And you, you're sitting. Okay. So the guy is, those are the kind of taxi. So I'm hammered, hammered. <laughs> and I go to the guy, I was like, how much is it? And I remember he said, it's like 30 bucks to your apartment. I was like, buddy, I'll give you 50. You take care of my girl in the back. I'll drove home. <laughs> the guy's like, you're serious? I was like, yeah. So he sat with the girl in the back and I drove the bike, swear to God, so drunk. I was going that, like that. I hit the curve and the guy's like, okay, can you just stop? I was like, yeah, no problem. So anyway, so I drove the bike, not, not that long. And anyway, so I went to the coach and I'm like, man, I'm struggling, man, in the city. He's like, okay, I'll move you out of the city. So they moved me on a golf course <laughs> in like Bear Mountain. It's like 20 minutes out of the city. Um, it's a... Uh, Stoner who played in the NHL, the defense, Clayton, uh, not Stoner, I don't know, he's a defense. That he's got an like apartment. The, a name, but yeah, okay. Yeah, something like that. He's got an apartment and he's renting to the team. He lives right on the golf course. So I'm there, still find a way to party. So after six game, man, I'm, I'm like, it's no points. I'm just, I'm not in my element. I'm like, man, this is not good. If I showed up to practice and I said, I asked the coach, I said, can you trade me? And he's like, uh, Tiff, take the weekend. Tonight the boys are going out. I know we're struggling. We're 0-5 or 0-6 or something like that. He's like, I know we're struggling. But just take the night. Go with the boys. Have fun. We'll talk about it on, on the next day. So next day we showed up and I walked in the dressing room and I looked up the line. I'm not on the line. So I walked into the office and he's like, yeah, I made my decision. I'm going to let you go, but you're a good guy. Uh, you know what? You're being honest. Uh, here's the book where you want to be traded. I was like, what do you mean? He's like, you pick your place and I'll make it happen. I was like, yeah, but if, if they're asking, uh, he's like, I won't even ask nothing. I'm just going to call a coach and I'll let you go. We'll figure it out. So I call and come back to Steve Martinson, who was in the UHL my first year. Steve was a good guy with me. And he was in Elmira with uh, the Donatis, Justin and Tyler Donati, who's from Ontario, which they're a legend in the coast too. And, um, he called and then he said, Tiff wants to come to Elmar. Do you want to make a trade? He's like, yeah, I'll take him. What do you want? He's like, I want nothing. Just, do you want him? He's like, yeah. So coach Morrison was really nice with me. Just, he's like, you know what? I'll let you go. Um, well, and good for him, man. Like and that he knew what was best for you and he was looking out for you. Right. He didn't try to yeah, hold he, on to you. And 
No, he didn't want to. He didn't want to bug. I think at the start of the trade, he asked for something, and then I remember he asked for something, and he hang up, and he said, "If he doesn't want to, and he calls back, I'll say it's okay." But he did try, which it's okay. He's a honest guy. But when he hang up, he looked at me, and he's like, "Well, I had to try something. I don't remember what was." The you name always got to try asking. something. Yeah, you always got. You always got to try like, a little bit. Yeah, you may yeah. as well. And then uh, he looked at me when he hang up. He's like, don't worry if he say no, I'll let you go. And he called back right after his practice. And he said, okay, I, I can't do with that guy. He's like, okay, I'll let it go for free. I'd probably money, something. They probably had money or I don't know. Come, I mean, You never some- know too, right? And there's some guys you just don't want on your team, right? But yeah. you go to Elmira and just run amok 56 points in 48 games at the coast. Yeah, it was that year too. I was on the second line because the Natties were so like they were leading up the team, and which it was okay. I, I I got on the second line with Oliver Pru, which I played with in my first year, but it was fun. Not not a great city, but had a pretty decent team that year. To be honest, I I this is just coming in my head. You can take this for what it is, but you like Dayton. You didn't mind Elmira. You succeeded in both places, and like. When I played with you, man, like you weren't like, I would say the flashiest guy out there. You weren't skating like you weren't oh, the fastest fast. skater. No, and I know, you, I know you're not fast, but like when it came to getting gritty in the quarters, when it came to like battling for a puck in a corner or around a net, man, your will and determination, but like you were gritty. You were kind of like the towns that you liked living in. And if it was too, too nice and too pretty, that's not for you, eh? Oh, no, 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 I couldn't, I couldn't do it. I don't know. I liked it, man. Like I said, I, I think I got 44 fights in my pro career. Let's be honest. I'm over 44. I love to throw once in a while. Like a lot of people see me with my white skate and, but yeah, like uh, you're me. a competitor. I always really enjoyed like play. I watching you play that year, man. I learned a lot from just how hard you were in the corners and like you were a skinny little wiry guy and the way you could roll off guys and take it to the net and you didn't care if you got hit or whatever happened. It was cool. Like I said, like, you know, like I can look like a little uh, skilled guy with the white skate, but you know what? I love that greedy game and I know to win a championship, uh, if if you're a skilled guy or not greedy down the road, you won't win any championship. Yeah. Uh, so I knew I had to do it. I, I like I said, I'm not perfect defensively. I'm not that great, but I know when I want my puck in the corner, I'll do anything to get out of that corner with the puck. I don't care if I have to lose two there. I don't care. I'll, I'll come out of the bit uh, of it with the puck. And like and I you said, did. I tried, tried <laughs> and you did. A bit more. I started starting fighting towards the end of my career. That was a bad decision too. I I fought Zach Smith. Zach Smith bury me you bury started me. fighting at the end of your career people fight at the start of their career and realize i know i was stupid because i was like if i start I, I wouldn't get a called up in the a and i'm like man maybe i gotta start fighting maybe they need <laughs> me to fight so i start fighting <laughs> and that year in elmara the year in elmara i'm talking about i think the second year i got 72 points i had 10 fights but that's the player you were and the way you played, like those things were going to happen. And like, man, when you were dominating and like playing your game, like it was as gritty as hockey got, but you were also scoring like well over a point a game. And that's when, when a guy like you wasn't getting called up or getting any attention, I was like, man, this guy's better than me. And like, he's not getting any attention. <laughs> it's the skating too. I knew a part of it was I didn't skate. And then, you know, and you play in the, a, you know, it's skate, the game is faster. So it's skating. It, was, my was, podcast is a lot of guys that never made it right. I'm like that level below that's who comes on here. And to be honest, it's skating that comes up all the time. Yeah. Skating. If you, and that's one thing. And sometimes I got out of it and sometimes, you know, like, I would still make my way to the A and, and, but you know, like down the road, that's what didn't help me was my skating. I know that there's other stuff, you know, I didn't take care of my body. I was probably partying a little bit too much. And, but you know, um, the skating was one part of it that didn't help me at all. Yeah. Especially it had to have been at a young age too. If you're putting up 42 points in junior and like, you're still Mm -hmm. not getting much of a look, it's probably, that's the only answer we can come up with here. So 
that year though, it's already like your fifth, six year pro and you're still getting 10 AHL games though. The year you're getting 73 points and fight 10 games a day or 10 times, <laughs> you're still getting 10 <laughs> AHL games, like five, six years in. That's pretty rare. Uh, that's the year I, I, I signed a two way. That was the only year I signed a two way, to be honest with bingo. And the reason why I did was I was a veteran and, um, I'm pretty sure you know the rule when you're a veteran in the coast and you sign a two way, you, you have to play 10 games to play in the playoff in, in the coast. coast. And that, and yeah, that was the your, rule. Yeah. yeah. If you don't play your 10 games, so I was like, man, if I can get my 10 games in, then you never know, have a couple points. And then so they up. gave you exactly your 10 games. Yeah. And then believe me, the, oh, my last, I'm at seven game. Listen to that. I'm at seven game and I'm in Elmara. And I'm like, man, it's almost down the end of the season. I'm getting nervous to not get my 10 game. And, and we're, re- we're ready to go. Re- uh, re- uh, Elmara ready to go to Vegas. And we're having a rookie party in Vegas. Oh, and I'm boy. like, yeah, man, I'm excited. Road yeah. trip to Vegas, so excited. And then I uh, showed up to the ring, get my stuff ready. We're flying out. And then the coach goes, hey, Tiff, um, you're getting called up to the A to bingo. I was like, oh, no. Seriously? He's like, yeah, we, I got to get your 10 game in. And we're towards the end of the season. I need your 10 game. I was like, man, seriously? And we're going to Charlotte, which Charlotte is a six city too. But I ended up going to Charlotte. Oh, that's- and then play three and three on St. Patty weekend. And then ends up playing my three and three. Zero shift. Not one. Not one. I didn't even play a shift. I sat in the middle of the bench. Literally didn't play one shift. He just wanted me to play my, my 10 game. Just to and be then- on the game sheet to get your 10 games. I did the same thing, but they didn't even have to give me the games. I got called up to the HL and I sat there for an entire game a couple times. One time I got called up from Dayton, like, and this is what was weird for me. You want to get called up. You're like, please call me up. I can't wait. Jeez. The HL sounds so fun. And I'm playing in Dayton. I'm on like, whatever you want to call it. The top line. There's your line. There's my line, right? My, my line with miser and Colin would play against like usually the other team scores. Right. And, yeah. and it was like, I felt like I was a part of it. All you guys were beauties. I loved being there. Everybody was having fun. And then you get called up to Syracuse and you play, like you fly all the way there. They make you go to these hotels and these bus trips and you get all the way there. And then they play you one shift and you're like, I'd rather go back to Dayton and play fucking yeah. hockey. <laughs> man, that, that's what sucks sometimes. And like that, that weekend I was so mad. I'm like, man, I just waste a trip to, to Vegas with the boys with, with your party. team, the team you're on, the boys yeah. you're with all year. That you're their star player, you're their first life player, their best player, and you're not on the fucking team trip to Vegas. And that year, I knew I was not going to play in bingo. That's the year they won the Calder Cup with with Offman and all those guys. They had a sick team, so I was like, I was. It's just because the year before, I I, I ends up playing seven game in Binghamton uh, at the end of the year, and I had four points. I was playing with Jonathan Chichu on the line. And, and, and at the end of the year, right when the season end, bingo called me and I said, we're going to sign you to a two way, which I was excited. I was like, man, I got my chance. That's why I was looking for my 10 game as a veteran. I'm like, man, this is the spot. The coach loved me. Sign me one week later. Coach gets fired. Oh, yeah. Um, and I was like, well, here we go. And here we go again. <laughs> Another broken rest. In, I'm like, I'm not man. getting a break. That's for sure. I'm not getting a break. And I see the guys that are signing Corey Locke, Andre Benoit. I, I see what's going on with Ottawa has a lot of young kids with uh, Z Smith, uh, Derek Smith, uh, like Offman, uh, O'Brien. Yeah. I was like, man, I'm not getting a sniff there. Uh, and they That's all just fun. keep coming every year. More kids come yeah. up every year. They just keep coming and coming. Um, okay. So then that year happens. So then you end up with the Chicago Express. Yeah, year. follow Steve Martins, and I followed Steve. Um, Steve went to a brand new team in Chicago, and that's where a relationship between Steve and me uh, ended. Uh, we we didn't see eye to eye on some stuff. Um, just uh, I don't know. I got older. I don't know. He, I don't know what happened. We're still good friend though. When uh, I had my jersey retirement and the uh, AC by uh, Reading Hall of Fame in, inducted. Uh, he called me that morning and, and said congrats and stuff. He was really nice, but just 
Hockey wise, we didn't see eye to eye for the fourth time we were together. So trade me to Reading uh, against and that, that and that oh. changes your life, eh? Getting traded to Reading, big time. Um, that's where I found my house, and then yeah. you know, like as happy, uh, uh, find a, finally win a cup there on my second year, and and I, the year that I got traded there, we were almost dead last, and uh, we made a push and we made it to the playoff. Um, and then a year after we won the cup, but like, so you know, I got, a qu- I got a question, man. You got traded there 17 games into the season with Chicago to Reading. The research team, it said that you were the captain that year. Yeah. We, uh, I ended up showing up there a month after I got an A on my Jersey and, um, uh, Ryan Crotters, who was their captain was going towards the end of his career. Uh, he was going to retire. And we want, they wanted to give him a chance to win a cup because we were not going to win a cup at that point. We were, like I said, dead last. And so he got traded to Alaska. Um, and then, uh, cause Alaska was hoping for a cup that year. And, um, Larry met me in the open and he said, hey, buddy, um, you, I'm going to give you the C. So it went pretty quick. It went from boom, A and, a, and I had an A in my Jersey in a month or two weeks or three weeks. I don't know to the captain and, isn't it uh, like kind of rewarding though? Like the way, I guess, you know, whatever people want to perceive people as, or like you, you say maybe you party too hard or whatever, but like, man, I, I never saw that in you. I didn't think you party too hard when I played with you. Um, I thought you were always a gamer. You're always ready to rock. And you were a leader on our team when you were like 21 years old, like you were the guy. Um and to be named a captain, like of a professional hockey team, that's got to be pretty freaking cool, no? It was. It was. To be honest, was fun. And and I never, uh, like you said, even when I was twenty one, I never took it as uh, you need a letter to be a leader. You, you you can be a leader in your own way. Um, yeah. Oh yeah. Yes, it's fun to have that C. But at the end of the day, I always said it doesn't matter. I had the C on my jersey. We're twenty one captain on the team. We're twenty guys. We're twenty captain on the team. Everybody can do it. Uh, it doesn't matter the letter. Uh, it doesn't matter your one game pro, thousand game pro. Uh, you just got to lead by example on your own way. And when I got that captain, it's it's going to sound stupid. There's two guys that in my life helped me to became a better person. Uh, they were captain. My first two year was Nathan Lutz uh, was my captain in Rockford, which played a little bit in the coast. And the guy we talked about earlier, Craig Lebinski. Uh, Labby, Labby learned, uh, show me how to be a better pro. And, and, you know, Labby, uh, great guy, great family guy. Um, just an honest worker. And just looking at those guys, you know, like there's guys in your career, you look at them and you're like, okay, uh, they're, they're, they're working hard. I want to be like that. And Lucy and, and Labby were two guys that helped me through my career. And when I got that seat, I wanted to be like those guys, you know, like, the and, way they- and you did say like, you changed a bit when you got it. Like, not that you changed, but like that you recognize, like I'm a captain now. I can't, I got to show them like, this is what you yeah. do. Right. I got to stay out after practice. I got to whatever. Well, you right? have a like- target on your back. You know, when you don't have a letter on your Jersey, sometimes guys, they do look at you, but they don't at the same time. They always look at the leader trick core. Uh, yeah. they, they look at it and, and, you know, now having to see, you're like, okay, I have a target on me. Like, you know, I, do, I got to do it the right way. Uh, can be like, but the other thing is it. you get it from being yourself. You got the captaincy from being yourself. The coach named you the captain because you were being Yannick Tifu. It wasn't because you're being someone else and mm-hmm. you would be the type of guy that wouldn't be someone else. You'd still be you. You just realize mm-hmm. there's a little more responsibility, right? <laughs> Yeah, there's just, like I said, it's just a little thing that you have to do differently a little bit. Like you said, stay after practice. Um, you can't, you know, a night before a game, you're not going to go and get hammered. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. guys are looking at you. So, a little thing like that. But for me, it didn't change. See or no on my jersey didn't change. My goal was always to to, to help the team to be better um, and and myself to be better every night. And when I, co- I showed up to the ring, I'm like, man, this is business. I get paid. I get paid to play hockey. Uh, make sure you're ready to work. What you do outside the rink, it's your own problem, but just take care of your body, do your stuff. When you show to the rink, you're part of a team. Uh, there's owner that pay you. Make sure you're ready to work. So it didn't really change for me to having a C on my jersey, but yes, it's always an honor and got the honor too of raising a cup as a captain. That's always something. Well, that's special. where we're <laughs> at, dude, is you were a captain. And speaking of Labber, though, before we move on, is he also taught me a lot. And I thought, 
having him as the captain, the Dayton Bombers that year um, that we were there is the only reason we go to the finals is he was married. He was like 27, which was really old for the rest of us. Mm -hmm. And he showed us like, yeah, you go out for a few, but like, you're, you're ready to practice tomorrow. Like even yeah. when he, he came out, like he would kind of say to like Miser and myself, he'd be like, listen, boys, like, I know you're having fun, but like, just remember, like I was here with you today. Don't be getting me and shit tomorrow either. Right. Like you guys be ready to rock. And like, you just learn from everybody as you go through time and hockey. Right. Well, he, like every practice, I remember Labby, we used to go to the, the B wing, the Buffalo wild wing and play golden tea. Golden oh, yeah. tea. Loved that golden tea. He had his card and every <laughs> practice he would say, Tiff, you're coming for one. We'll go play golden tea. And that's the kind of guy he is. He doesn't mind. You're 20, you're 25, you're, you're 22. He'll take care of you. He'll take care of you. And he, He'll bring you, he won't, like, you're part of the team. For him, that was his family. So, you know, you're part of the family. He was awesome. Absolutely He was awesome, awesome. to be honest. Yeah, okay. I got sidetracked again. But, yeah, Laber was awesome. So, you were the captain, and um, you guys win it all. So, who do you beat? How does it go? How does those playoffs go? Uh, to be honest, it was a rock. That, that year was was a rock and roll year because we started with a lockout year, and, um, we had a lot of guys from, from uh, every practice at the start of the year, Washington, because it was Washington, Hershey, and us. And Washington, uh, Adam Motes, George McPhee, they were at every single game. Uh, Adam Motes came on the ice uh, with us. He was going a week in Hershey, a week in Reading, you know, see the prospect. So I think he got the kid a little bit nervous, like her draft pick kid. And we started the year one and five. And then we just went on a, on a, on a tear after, and I think we lost 13 game all year. And then in the playoff, we beat Greenville in the first round, which uh, the four games we won, we won by shutout. <laughs> <laughs> and and I remember Dean Stoke, the coach of Greenville, uh, in, a, in an interview after uh, game three, he said, uh, he said, they, they asked him, what are you going to do? You know, three shutout, like, what are you going to do? And he goes, I don't know. They're too good. I don't know what to do. <laughs> to be honest that's what he said i don't know what to do and uh so ends up winning that one uh, with four shutout and then we we faced florida which was the best was was the the the, the toughest series because florida just won the year before and they had kind of the same the same core uh oh, yeah. the same guys were there and uh, ends up winning the series in seven which uh quickly we we were up uh, you remember in the coast the series or two three two right you played because we're not like the yeah NHL yeah because you, well, you don't want to travel too much it costs too much travel. money yeah so we had a two three two so ends up splitting at home splitting the, we split at home one and one we go on the road game two uh, game three we lost game three we're down two one and then game four we're down two goals with six minutes left, which you go down three, one against a team that just won the championship defending champ. You have a game five in Florida. There's no way you're pulling it out. It's impossible. So we're down two goals with six minutes left. Uh, we got a five on four and a five on three back to back. So we're five on four. They picked up an, another penalty. We go on a five on three tied. Uh, we made it uh, four, three, four, four on the same power play five four so five, you get the three. five on three then you get the five on four goal yeah and then we we made it uh we and then made the it. juices are flowing and the boys are rolling and then you score again and then we won in overtime on the tj signer goal uh and then game five we ends up winning in overtime on a even barlow goal in overtime which we tied a game again late in the third and then we came back game six at home uh loss and then game seven at home we won two one and they had a full five on three with two minutes left into the game, a full five on three. For and, two minutes? Uh, Riley, two minutes, full two minutes. And Riley Gill just stood in on his head, made some save left and right. And we pull up the two one win at home on game seven. Ends up playing Cincinnati. Uh, so the Cincinnati. semifinals was game seven against Florida again, just like yeah. we did. No, that, that was uh, not the semifinal. That was the second round. We did semifinal against Florida to go to the cup. Florida was the second round, which oh. I felt bad for Florida because second round against us for them like was not the matchup they wanted. They probably wanted us in the in the conference final. Um, and then Florida, and then we, we beat Cincinnati. A lot of people, I still talked to a couple guys, they say Cincinnati was the hardest series. 
which I don't think it was. We won in five, but four games in overtime. We won all of four games in overtime. Uh, three. We won three. They won one in overtime. In the last game, we won like 5-1, game five. But uh, game one went in a triple what overtime. Year, what year of life is this? What year did you win? 2012. Okay. 2012. And then, uh, yeah, so beat, beat Cincy in five. And then we went to Stockton, which Stockton was the miracle kid. They just keep pulling out wins, coming back. They were they, they made the playoff as a sixth seed, and they just beat everybody on comebacks and comebacks. They wouldn't give up, and I think they, they ran out of juice in the final. Uh, first game went in overtime. We won 6-5, but we didn't play well. We're trading goals. We didn't play the right way. Second game won 4 nothing. then won 3 nothing. Uh, game three. Lost game four because – I think we're a little bit like, you know, like we're ready already thinking about the rings and the cup and everything. And then game five, that happens. Like, okay, we, do we go home and win at home or we do it on the road? And we're like debating. And I was like, oh, we can't take the, the chance to go back game six at home and something no, happens. You get, when you get game finisher, seven. you got a doer. And it was six nothing after two periods. Between the second and the third, I can believe me, it was hard to like keep composed and then, oh, it would be know, focus on the goal. Like it was hard. Like guys. Um. Like, so speaking of guys that never get breaks or move up or go places, right? There's one interesting story. I I guess he started in the Southern Pro League and one in the coast with you guys was he went to Western Michigan University. It was Riley Gill, the goalie. He went to Western Michigan University right after me, and his pro career. He basically stopped pucks wherever he went and won games, but never got opportunities, right? Never. I don't think he played in the end. He won what? He's got two MVP in the final. He's I got looked at pucks. the stats from your team. The research team was hot today. Your two goalies that year were Philip Grubauer and Riley Gill. And Riley Gill's stats were incredibly better than Philip Grubauer's. Groups. <laughs> Right. We had Drew McIntyre too. We had Drew McIntyre as a goalie played uh, playing the show. Drew, man, and Riley was just Riley was on a mission, man. Like I said, won three Kelly Cup. And he's the uh, type of guy like you. He's trying to prove everybody wrong. Like, look at me, yeah. I can play goalie, and nobody pays attention. <laughs> man, we had no goalie at one point, and we find Riley getting in the SPHL. He had no equipment. The goal, the coach in SPHL, they want to leave him go with his equipment. He's like, you want to go, go. You don't have equipment. Rally showed up to Reading without even equipment. The and then he stopped was, everything without, with all new year. Unbelievable. He was so like, he was in the zone. It was crazy. Um, he was, yeah, he got MVP that year. I think he got five or six shot out in the playoff. Uh, he was well, just, it would have been you or him. Cause you led the, the playoffs and scoring. So that's pretty cool. I know both of you. Eh? <laughs> Well, at the end of the day, you know what? I didn't really care. I was so excited on the ice. I didn't care about MVP or not. I was like, man, just yeah, give me that trophy. It's nobody would care. Chasing. And you're the I captain, and you get to pick it up. And, yeah, we had to watch them do it. I remember watching oh, yeah. it. I remember Idaho picking it up in Dayton. I was so beside uh, myself. That's why, like, it took me, like, what, almost uh, five, six, seven years, seven years to make it back there. I was like, man, that was long. That was long, a long time. And then it was in the back of my mind the whole time when I'd all raise it at the Nutter Center in Dayton. I was like, man, I didn't, you know, it was hard to watch. And yeah, it, was, yeah, I, it, it took a long time. Well, you did it, man. So what happens when you win it in Reading? Do you uh, have a parade? Yeah, we had a parade, which I was really surprised. It was really nice. We came back uh, from Stockton. And when we got there, there was uh, uh, fire trucks and police uh car waiting for us 15 minutes outside of the town and they pulled us over on the side of the road and uh we uh they they escorted us all the way to reading um then we partied at night and then the next day we had that parade which was like probably a mile and a half we started at like down the street and came back all the way to the ring and seriously there was probably let's say 10 15 000 people in the street it was it was so neat uh to be to be honest you watch it on on TV, Stanley Cup and stuff, they have a million of people uh, in the street. But for an ECHL team, I have 15, 17,000 in the street. And we're just coming down. Uh, and then at the rink, we had like a little uh, little, little something inside of the rink. They were presenting every player. And then we did a speech, which was really nice. And then we partied for uh, like two or three days. Went back home and uh, we had a day with the Cup, which was really nice. We had the day with the Cup. So I had the chance to bring it home in Montreal, party with my friend at the bar. 
And I had a poutine in, in the cup that I made myself at the restaurant at three in the morning. It was so fun. Had a blast. So, yeah, it was fun. Oh, man. I Winning is, I like, I did it a few times. And, like, it was literally the best days. Like, other than, like, you know, getting married and having kids. Like, with the, yeah. the times that I won, those days are what I remember other <laughs> than, you know, having kids and a wife, right? Yeah. Like, that's what I remember were those days. And I'm sure you'll never forget. Okay. No. So I have to pee extremely bad, but I don't want to leave you hanging, you know, cause English isn't even your first language. So I'm not going to go out and pee um, <laughs> and make you talk to a random screen here. So you win it all. You're the captain. You go back there for one more year as the captain. Yeah. One, yeah, one more year. And then you guys do all right, but then you finally decide to head to Europe, eh? Yeah, I went to Europe for one year. I decided, you know what, the reason why I came back, I should have went after the cup to Europe, but I wanted to see the raise of banner and everything. You know, I was like, man, I want to repeat too. I was like, I never been a champion and I wanted to feel what was having a target on yourself. You know what I mean? Like, like Florida had that target. We were waiting for Florida that year. And I'm like, man, we've got to be, to beat, if you want to be a champion, you got to beat the champions. No, but then, you're you're a competitor and you like a battle. You like you like you like to compete. I know you. You like to give her. You like to go into the corner against a guy or maybe two and be like, I'm gonna come out here with this puck and then I'm gonna slide it back door to a guy to tap it in. Watch this. And like <laughs> you wanted to play again and beat the East coast again. <laughs> That's literally what I wanted to do, but I, I know went. you did. I know you did. You should have left. You should have made more money. Did you make more money when you went to France than in the East coast? Yeah, I, I did. I did. I made decent money, but I, you know, I, I used it to, to travel and stuff like that, but I kept some good money to be honest. It was a good salary. So, um, but like I said, I went to so many places in Europe. I just wanted to travel with my ex-wife. So I play one more year there, which was fun. But the people like- that go over there to be tourists instead of go over there to like kind of like your East Coast, like the guys that go over there to make a career of it. Like when I went over to Germany at 23 or 24 or whatever mm-hmm. it was, like I went over there with like the purpose, of like I'm making a career of this. And mm-hmm. then there's the guys that go over there near the end of their careers that literally go over there to kind of be tourists and see shit. And those aren't the guys that last long, but you no. dominated that league. I looked at the stats. You had like way more points than everybody else again. Well, I, the, 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 the reason too, I went over there. Yes. To travel. But like we said earlier, man, and when I do something, I do it. Like I always told my mom and dad the day that um, like the reason why I retired from pro um, when I was 30 is, and it's going to answer that question is I always said to myself, the day that I'm going to show up to the rink and it's going to be a job, which I'm there to collect money. Uh, I'm going to retire because it's a game that I've been playing since I was a kid. I enjoy it's a game at the end of the day. Um, so I said the day that it's going to be work and I'm going to be grumpy at the rink and I'm there because I need the money. I'll just go home and do something else and give the chance to younger kids to play that game and have the chance to live the same dream that I live. And I went to Europe. Yes, I wanted to visit. And, but I was there. I was there at the rink. I was doing business as usual. My goal was to win a championship. I was focused on it. But yes, I did use that to, to travel and relax a little bit. And to be honest, the year we won the cup, we played 99 games all year with the exhibition and everything. And then the year after I played it almost again, 80, my body was just like, I couldn't do it anymore. So that's the reason why I went down there. Too. I, I honestly couldn't imagine how you did it. Cause I played one year in the coast in the A and that year between Syracuse and Dayton, I played, oh, I think, over 100 hockey games in one nice. year. And I was, my body was ruined. And then everybody's like, well, for next year, you got to get bigger. You got to get stronger. You got to put on 15 pounds of muscle. And it's like, yeah. well, I, I just played till the end of June. How do you want me to do that? I got two months here. <laughs> what do you want that's from a, me? <laughs> yeah. So that's why. That's the reason why I went over there. I enjoyed my time, but I. Like I said, after that year too. But you would have been getting offered contracts after you go over there, put up those numbers. You must have been getting some calls. Yeah, yeah, they were, they were, they were contract. Uh, Angé was asking me back too. We had a little talk, and and the wife, you know, you got to make decision in life. And yeah. the wife had a job at Hydro One, and uh, the ex-wife had a job at Hydro One in in Perth. 
and she couldn't she couldn't say no and there was no way I was gonna go um there was no way I was gonna go to um we were getting married that summer right after uh, Angers I was getting married and there was no way I was gonna go to Europe without my wife I was like right. you know I, I, yeah I that, yeah so she's like you know I did all the sacrifice your whole life I follow you but Right now, like I'm, I'm getting an offer at either one, and I want to stay. So that's the reason why I said I'm going to come back home. And at the start, I, I so like, you signed like, with the Brampton Beast. Yeah, I signed with Brampton Beast, which um, it was so hard. Where are you living in Perth? I was in Perth, and how then, far is that to get to Brampton? Two and a half, two and a half, which three probably around that. If I'm, I'm not mistaken. So I think where, where are you living? Are you living in Brampton and then just seeing her when you can? No, I think it was in, yeah, we were, I was in Brampton, but the thing is she was asking for transfer to either one in, in Brampton, but the hardest decision was I always said that the day I'm going to retire, I'm going to retire as a Reading Royal. I wanted to retire as a Reading Royal. So I asked my wife, can I play one more year in Brampton? And Larry, Larry keep calling me and said, you want to come for one year? And I said, no, I'm going to play in Brampton, Larry, sorry, my wife would I draw and everything. And she's, he's like, okay. I was like, can I ask you one thing is next, this is my last year and next year, can I sign one game and play one game? I want to retire as a Reading Royal. That's all I'm asking, Larry, please. I said, no problem, Tiff. Then I showed up to Brampton and um, my wife didn't get a transfer. And after six games, we're struggling. And, you know, Toronto area has a lot of hockey player, veteran hockey player. And the coach met me in the office and said, Tiff, listen, we're having a struggle of a year. We only allowed four veteran. And right now, uh, I got veteran, two guys that play in the A and one that play in the show that want to come down. And I told them I got to give a chance to my veteran right now. But if it's not working, I'm going to make some change. And he said, I'm sorry, Tiff. Uh, I got to let you go because I well, said, that, where you go? Yeah. And you said, Redding. And then I said, I, I said, give me five minutes. I, I'm going to ask the wife and I asked I ask my ex-wife. I said, can I go to Redding? I'm going to finish. I know you won't be there. I know you'll be working, but I'll be my last year. And then uh, she's like, yeah, no problem. This is your last year. So I went to Reading. He called Larry. Larry said, no problem. You're coming down. And I played one more year and then I was done. I said, I'm done after that. So, um, But like that, I, I understand why you want to go back to Reading so much. And like you won a championship there. You win the trophy. The coach is so great to you. Like it's kind of like my story with the Cardiff Devils. I know you wouldn't know anything about it, but like, when a team takes a shine to you and you take a shine to them and then you win something and like, mm -hmm. it just holds something in your heart. Right. And you're like, this is forever. <laughs> right. Uh, that, like I said, like I'm, I'm, I'm like, I didn't have the chance because of the COVID right now, but last year we were supposed to play a alum, an alumni against uh, the old flyers, which was Eric Lindros, John Leclerc and some alumni from Reading. And I always said, you know, every year I get it, every year I'm going to go down in Reading and see, see a game and see the fan and talk to the people. But with COVID, I didn't have the chance the last two years. Uh, hopefully we get over with that thing and I can go and then, you know, see, see I want to go every year. That's the plan. And um, I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it every year. Uh, like I said, probably and next year I the chance I'm going to go. Well, a uh, team's retires your jersey like number 10 is retired so was i wearing your number then when i when you got to date i was gonna say man when i got there didn't you have a number off, 10 I, on you didn't you have like a chain yeah, with the number 10 i had a necklace and i said i said i came down and i'm like oh man i wear number 19 i remember and then i was like ah oh. it's like i almost pulled some money and i said i'm gonna ask him if i can buy it but you were up and down in the a which uh there's one thing in my life i always respect you played two. I played two hundred game in the, in the coast. You played two hundred one. For me, you're older than me. I'll respect you. You're and then you play in the A. I never played in the A. I was like, oh man, I won't do that. I won't ask him. But I was re I was willing to pay. I was like, man. Well, hey, I like and, and the thing for me was like when I couldn't wear number ten, I wore number nineteen. I did that in uh, Denmark. <laughs> yep. Oh, we could have swiped back in the day. <laughs> I wanted 10. I didn't want 19. Uh, I had always been 10. I had been 10 at Western Michigan when I was like, uh, when I was a budding star, you know, and then I was too fat for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so no. So for me, like, like I but said, you I, have I, number I 10 remember. in the rafters, right? In, in a pro hockey arena, there's number 10 and nobody will ever wear that again because of you. So good work, dude. 
Thanks, thanks. It's it's to be honest, it's just you know, growing up in Montreal, I had the chance to, to go to a lot of games at the Bell Center and the Forum back in the day. And then you you know, as a kid, you look on top, and we have a lot of jersey retired in Montreal, like you know, like almost. 15 or 17 and then you're like man one day i want to have my jersey retired like you're, oh. you're a young kid and you're like every and, kid uh, wants that and then at the end of the day i'm looking at it and yes it's maybe not the nhl it, it, it's 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 minor hockey but it's an accomplishment not just and i said it in my speech it's not an accomplishment for me it is for my family you know it doesn't say yannick on top it said tifu which mom dad And, and it's all the sacrifice they did for me growing up. And for me, it's just, it's a way of saying thank you. You know, like my family is, it's not just Yannick known, it's the Tifu are known in Reading, which is mom, dad, my brother, everybody was part of that, that journey that took and they me would all come the down there. there. Would they come there and meet everybody? And yeah, they were there a lot. And then uh, the, the, the Reading were so nice about the retirement and, and uh, they asked me how many people are coming and mom, dad, Um, I, I have six buddies that I grew up I, I, since we we're three years old. Uh, it's been 34 years. We're friends and uh, we've been best men to our, our weddings and stuff. Yeah. And uh, the organization took care of everybody. Uh, they got everybody down there. Um, I had a box, I had a box uh, at the rink, pay for the, everything, the, the alcohol, the food during the game, um, which was really nice. They took care of everything. They said, how many people you want to bring? We'll, we'll make it happen. So I brought like almost 30 people uh, down there, which was unbelievable, to be honest. And right. I, a story at my wedding in Perth, Ontario, I had 10 fans of Reading on my list at my wedding in Ontario, which they came down. Yeah. 10 I, fans of the team but, were at my wedding. But and what, what's interesting to me is like, that's who you are. That's the type of guy you are. And like, that's why I wanted to have you on in the shed was because I remembered you being like that in 2006, 2007. And I'm like, this is a dude that's a great teammate, a great person. Like, yeah, he likes to have fun, but fuck. So do all of us. And like, but you were, you're just a great dude. And you were smart. Like you're happy. You're a happy person. You showed up to the rink. You were happy. You were happy to be there. And it was like, when you say, when it was first becomes a job, it's time to get out. Well, that happened to me in Germany. I went over there and then you kind of see what kind of money can be there. And then it's like about points and it's not about winning. And it's like, it changes your outlook and it's yeah. not good for you. Um, but like, Oh, I lost my train of thought again. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Mix the beer, mix in a beer, buddy. But you're Jeez. right. It, everything, everything down in Europe too. Like it gets to, You got points to sign again, and then you're but, but the thing is, is the coast and the AHL was the same thing. You got to do it anywhere. If you're not putting up points, you're not going anywhere. But like the good people I played with, like, and like you can take this for what it is, right? Like, I, I, I didn't play with many French guys, I really didn't. But you and dupes, Stefan Robitaille was one. Yeah. Um, he's an old boy, you might not know him, he's like. God, that guy's got to be 50 by now. But anyways, like you dupes, um, like there were some French guys that were just like the best teammates. And I know it's hard for you guys because you're living in Canada, North America. And like, this isn't your first language. I had to fly all the way to Germany to feel out of place. Right. Yeah. yeah. You no, guys just had to hard, move to the not far away. Like I said, it was it was hard to be honest because some teams I played and I didn't have any French guys with me. But at the end of the day, I always told myself it has nothing to do with the language. You're part of a family. You're part of, of a group, and make sure you fit in. And 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 you know you got to learn how to live with different character. And guys are different, but you know what? At the end of the day, we all have the same goal: is we want to win a championship. We we want to be part of a group, and so that's one thing. And and I, I got lucky on my teams that. Like I said, guys took care of me. And then, you know, as a young guy, like I said, Labby, Kells, guys were nice with me. They they never, like, pushed well, me in the corner. And, and Derek Clancy was also a big deal, too, right? Yeah. Like, realistically, you, you look at that team, Labinsky, Derek Clancy, like, there were some guys, and Kells is your roommate. I Like, there are some guys on that team. Like, there's a reason why we went to the finals. We had a team full of great dudes. And there was – there's a reason why your jersey's retired in Reading, and it's 
it's because you're a great dude, you're a teammate, but you also have 10 fans to your wedding in Ontario. Like there's not many hockey dudes in the world that take the time to go talk to the fans and make them feel like they actually like, why wouldn't you want to know the people that are supporting you paying their money to come watch you? Like this is supposed to be fun, right? That's mm-hmm. I remember what I was going to say now was the first time I ever got a paycheck for playing hockey was when I left Western Michigan and I went to Syracuse and then Dayton or whatever. And they gave me the first paycheck. And I was like, Holy shit. I actually make money to play hockey. Like when you get a scholarship, it doesn't really feel like you do, but when they actually give you a paycheck and it goes in your account, you're like, no way. They're actually paying me to do this. It's kind of like when I started making money, doing a podcast, it's like, (laughs) no way they're going to, I'm going to make money drinking beers with my friends. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, that's what's fun. But at the end of the day, like I said, yes, like it's easy when I said I, I, I didn't do it for the money and stuff. Yes, it's still a job, but I didn't want to make it. You always got to think that if you make it to the NHL, I get it. But if you don't, when you're 30, 31, I mean, your life is not done. You still have to work when you come out. And that's why I said this is not my first job. My first job will be when I retire. Um, but I did it because I love the game and it was so fun. And I had the chances to see the world, to be honest, almost like, you know, you go to Europe, you see different country. Um, I had a chance to make some new friends. Um, and, you know, I, I, I became a better person. I always say, and I, I, I coach hockey back home. And I always say to my kids, hockey, you may never make it to the NHL, but hockey is, is like, it's a, it's school of life. You learn how to be a better person. You learn how to live with different person that are not, they don't have the same like character. You. They're not, they they're not the same background. They, they're different. Yeah. They, yeah. No, so no, you gotta learn. And that's what made me become when I retire at 30, it made me become a better person. And I learned some stuff about me that I didn't even know, you know what I mean? And then I became, and then I'm bringing this now into coaching with the young kids and I'm trying to help them to maybe not make the same mistake I did. And, you know, I'll teach them some stuff that I did that probably is going to help them down the road and some stuff that they shouldn't be doing because it's probably not going to help them down the road. So, you know, like I said, hockey was for me was everything. And that's the reason why I still play and I still enjoy playing that game, you know. And that's why you're in the States right now playing in the Federal League. (laughs) Oh, boy. And that's why I'm out my shed about to piss my pants is because we both love the game and like we can't get enough of it. Of uh, It's more about the boys and, and, and like everything it teaches you, but being part of a team and going for a championship and just, just enjoying the whole thing. Right. Yeah. That's all man. But it's a, it's been hard though. Two days here, my first day I lost my phone in the apartment. There was a, uh, my phone fell off the bed. I reached <laughs> to grab my phone and there's a, there's a hole between the wall and the carpet. So my phone is under the, the, the foundation under the bed. I can't get it. And then yesterday we played in Big Hampton. We get to the ring. The bus broke down. Listen to that. We the, the owner here owns Big Hampton too. So Bingo goes play Dan Barry yesterday, uh, Friday or Saturday. They come back from the game. It's like a what a three hour drive. I think I don't know. And then we get to the rink. We're playing at three o'clock Sunday in Bingo. So we get there at nine o'clock. No bus. So the coach goes, Hey, we got an issue here. Big Hampton is stuck on the side of the road. The guys slept on the bus. They're waiting for the fans to come get them. But we don't have a bus, so you guys are going to have to drive, which is not a long drive, which is a two-hour drive. But, man, Bingo, when we got to the ring, Bingo was just getting to the ring. Man, poor guys. They didn't sleep. Man, they didn't sleep. The equipment was wet. It was reminds like, me of another- Dayton, Ohio. It actually reminds me of Dayton, Ohio. I remember oh, doing man. that shit with Dayton, Ohio. I am actually going to pee my pants. So – are you willing to keep talking while I go pee or do you want me to shut this down? Cause I'm going to pee my pants. Well, I, I'll go get a beer then. So it, we're I'll done. Go get a beer, yeah. So okay. shut down that. Hey, yeah, go. this has been another episode of two ales and hockey tales with Tiff and Wally or Tiff. <laughs>